This family friend speaking on GMTV earlier says the family's frantic. They've been looking themselves, they walked along the hedgerows and they've been out shouting but there's nothing else they can do unless they get some support from, from the police over there or the police here. That's Jill Rennick. She told GMTV the shutters on the hotel room had been broken and the family believed their daughter's been taken. Well, as you can imagine, as a mother, it's the worst thing for anybody to happen. She's, she's been taken. That, I mean, she's been taken, that's all they know. Before we start, I would like to point out why I have made yet another Madeleine McCann film. It is to expose the mainstream media and show to the widest possible audience that their purpose is not to find out facts, investigate stories, then truthfully report them. The mainstream media are used on a daily basis across all publications by an elite few for a range of nefarious purposes. Mainstream media publications are no more than information prostitutes who serve those with enough money or power to help them with their disgusting agendas. When watching this film, please make a note of any time a mainstream media publication is mentioned and note what their motive is for reporting their story. Note also the disgraceful level of access held throughout by Clarence Mitchell to be able to seemingly plant any story into any British newspaper he wished. We suspect that whenever any news item has been written which includes quotes or opinions from a friend of the McCann's, this friend is always in fact the media spin doctor Clarence Mitchell. In my first documentary about the reported disappearance of Madeleine McCann, I gave an overview of the case. I presented the evidence of the alerts provided by two cadaver dogs, which suggested that there had been a body in the McCann's apartment. I looked at how the McCann's reacted to these disturbing results, and I went on to take a detailed look at the assortment of highly controversial detective agencies and individuals, some of them criminals, who were supposedly employed to look for Madeleine. And in the final part of that film, I give details of how state security and intelligence agencies like MI5 and Special Branch and the government's top PR staff have been involved in this case from the start. In my second film, I explained the extraordinary story of how the two main figures thought to have been Madeleine's abductor, Tannerman and Smithman, were possibly fabrications to try to prove that there was an abductor when, as my films have shown, there was no evidence whatsoever of one. I also showed how these highly questionable sightings were possibly based on the description of a Polish man, Wojciech Krakowski, a strangely dressed Polish man who happens to be holidaying in the village of Priadolos in the same week as the McCanns. Just a few months after I released my film about Krakowski, the Sunday People ran a major article about him, suggesting that he might yet be able to help the police with their inquiries. Finally, I showed that a man, stated on a BBC Crime Watch film to have come forward six years after the event to say it was him who had been carrying a child near the McCann's apartment the night she was reported missing, was most likely also a fabrication, this time by the Metropolitan Police team supposed to be investigating the disappearance. I established in my first film that there was strong evidence that Madeleine had died in the McCann's apartment. In this film, I am going to try and establish when Madeleine might have died. In another film, I will explore what we can deduce about how she might have died. I am going to do this by working backwards through each of the claimed sightings of Madeleine during the days prior to the abduction claim starting with the McCann's claim that they discovered Madeleine missing around 10pm on Thursday the 3rd of May. 
I showed in my first film how there was a mass of contradictions and changes of story by the McCanns and their Tapper Seven friends about their claimed discovery that Madeline was missing. We also saw how the children's bedroom appeared to have been arranged so as to promote the claim that Madeline had been abducted and the room broken into by a stranger. The only evidence that they found Madeline gone at 10 p.m. that night comes from the McCanns themselves. So let's now examine what was claimed to be the previous occasion on which someone else claimed to have seen Madeline. This was a visit that the McCann's friend, Dr. Matthew Oldfield, claimed to have made to check on the children in the McCann's apartment at around 9.25 that evening. His alleged visit to check on the children in the McCann's apartment was reconstructed in a Channel 4 documentary shown on the 7th of May 2009 a documentary which merely reported the McCann's account of events and was therefore not in any sense independent. Matthew Oldfield spoke to both the Portuguese police and a year later to Leicestershire police, giving long, rambling, sometimes incoherent answers. So let's break down the essentials of what he told the police about his alleged 9.25pm visit. He said that one one or other of the group stood up every 15 minutes to go and check on the children. 2. He left with another doctor member of the group, Dr. Russell O'Brien, at 9.25pm. He was going to check on his own children. Dr. O'Brien, he says, was going to check on his two young girls, Ella and Evie. 3. He cannot explain why, on this occasion, the group departed from their normal procedure, with two of them leaving at the same time to check on the children. 4. Kate McCann had stood up to check on her children, but he offered to go instead. He told the Portuguese police that he didn't really know why he did that. 5. He went first of all to his own apartment, checked on his child, and then went to the apartment of his friend, Russell O'Brien. He doesn't explain why he went there. 6. When he got to his friend's apartment, he says that one of Russell O'Brien's daughters was crying. He told Oldfield that she was ill and had vomited. 7. He then went to the McCann's apartment, having allegedly been told by Kate McCann that when they set off to the tapas restaurant, she had deliberately left the patio door closed but unlocked, so that he would be able to just walk into the apartment to do his check. 8. He noticed the door to the children's room was half open, or, as he puts it more accurately, 50 degrees open. 9. He says he didn't actually go into the children's room. 10. He can't recall how near he got to the children's room. 11. He could see the children in their cots in the middle of the room, but not Madeline, who was sleeping in a bed by the wall. 12. He says he recalls that the curtains, which he says were green in colour, were drawn closed. But the curtains were not green, as the photographs of the apartment clearly show. They were blue and white. 13. He wasn't sure if the window was open or not. 14. He can't recall if the shutters were open or closed. 15. He thought that there was more light in the children's room than in his own children's room that he had checked earlier. 16. He had the feeling that some light was coming from the outside, possibly because, he says, the blinds were partly up. 17. He is sure that when he passed by the McCann's window half an hour earlier that the shutters had been raised. So let's now unpick that statement. Despite him claiming that members of the group were doing their own check every 15 minutes, which was later contradicted by the other members of the group who claimed they were checking every half hour on this occasion, for some unknown reason two of them leave the table to do their checks together. It's important to emphasize at this point that going by the witness statements of the McCanns and all their friends, this was the very first time in the whole week that anyone had offered to check on another member's children. But even then, there are so many contradictions and inconsistencies about what the group all say about the events of that fateful evening that we really have to take any statement they make about those events with a very large pinch of salt. Oldfield must have taken a good look at the curtains, as he notices they were closed. He also noticed that the apartment seemed light. Yet, when asked by the police what colour they were, he gets it wrong. He says green, when in fact they were blue and white. 
Let's now take a look at what Kate McCann says about this occasion. She states that as she got up to check on the children, Matthew Oldfield said to her, I'll check on Maddie for you. Now, why would Oldfield say that? There were three children in the McCann's apartment. Why didn't he say, I'll check on the children for you? That alone suggests the accounts of both Matthew Oldfield and Kate McCann may be fabricated. Second, would the McCanns really have left their apartment unlocked? Very few people on holiday would leave their money, valuables, passport and credit cards in an unlocked apartment, never mind three children under four. And when we look in detail at what Oldfield does and doesn't say in his statement, it has the appearance of having been carefully crafted in order to back up Jane Tanner's claim that she saw the abductor at about 9.15pm. Jerry McCann says he finishes his alleged check on the children at 9.10pm. Jane Tanner says she saw an abductor at 9.15pm. Oldfield then backs up this scenario by speaking of the door being more open than before, claiming there was more light in the room and the blinds were partially up, etc. There is the addition of the very specific remark that the door was 50 degrees open. This remark shows every sign of having been made to tie in with the McCann statements that they left the door slightly ajar when they went down for dinner at 8.30pm that evening. However, Jerry McCann also in his second statement to the Portuguese police on the 10th of May said that he did his check at 9.05pm that evening, half an hour or so before Matthew Oldfield. He too found the door more open than before. In his first statement to the police on the 4th of May, Jerry McCann gave few details to the police about his 9.05pm check, but now he gives these extra details. He noticed that the children's bedroom door was not ajar as he had left it, but halfway open, returning to place the door how he had already previously described. So he says the door was left ajar, they went down for dinner at 8.30pm, then he found it half open, 45 degrees, and then, as he leaves the apartment, he closes the door again, leaving it ajar. Jerry McCann seems in this statement to be trying to convince the police that someone may have entered the flat before his check. Then, Matthew Oldfield comes along half an hour later and comes up with a tale that suggests that someone may have entered the apartment after Jerry's check. I suggest that they were all trying much too hard to show that an abduction really happened. In fact, this suggestion that someone had twice left the door open more than before, the first time at 45 degrees angle and the second time at 50 degrees angle, it seems then led Jerry McCann to make the astounding claim that the abductor could have been hiding in the apartment the entire time he did his alleged check at 9.05pm. This, for example, was how the Daily Telegraph reported this issue on the 21st of September 2007. Jerry's certain he was in bedroom with kidnapper. Jerry McCann is convinced his daughter's kidnapper was hiding behind a door in their holiday apartment as he checked on his sleeping children, according to a friend. But as he turned to leave the ground floor room, he noticed that a door, which he thought he had closed earlier, was slightly ajar. Agonizingly, he is now sure that standing behind this door was his four-year-old daughter's abductor, waiting to steal her from her bed in the Pridella's apartment. Jerry McCann believes there was certainly something odd, the friend said. The bedroom door was ajar when he got in and he thought, that's strange. He went into the room, checked that Madeline was still asleep in bed. She was and he came out, closed the door. Initially, he thought she might have got up and gone to the toilet or gone to get a drink or something, but now he thinks that the abductor must have been in there, hiding. He believes the abductor came in, opened the door and didn't have time to close it before Mr. McCann arrived. After Mr. McCann checked the room at 9.05pm, Russell O'Brien offered to check the children. At 9.30pm, he listened at the door, but crucially did not go in. In another statement, Jerry McCann specifically said that he went into all four rooms of the apartment when he did his check at 9.05pm. He also volunteered the surprising information that he had spent an exceptionally long time in the loo. It's very hard to see how an abductor could have been hiding behind a door somewhere in the apartment for all of the five minutes Jerry McCann was doing his check. 
it's hard to work out what is supposed to have happened. We are told by Jerry that he turned to leave the ground floor room. Which room? He noticed that a door, so which door was that? Which he thought he had closed earlier. Which door had he closed earlier? Was slightly ajar. Jerry McCann adds, agonizingly, he is now sure that standing behind this door was his four-year-old daughter's abductor waiting to steal her from her bed. It seems that Jerry McCann is describing the children's bedroom and suggesting that the abductor was hiding in there. But it looks as though Jerry had by this time, September, forgotten what he told the Portuguese police back on the 10th of May. Then he had told them he noticed that the children's bedroom door was not ajar as he had left it, but halfway open. But now in this Telegraph article he tells his friend, no doubt Clarence Mitchell once again, that he noticed that a door which he thought he had closed earlier was slightly ajar. So it seems that Jerry McCann has changed his evidence by first saying he left this door ajar, but now in this Telegraph article saying it was closed when he left it. It seems clear that it's the children's bedroom door that he's talking about, as the article goes on to say. The bedroom door was ajar when he got in and he thought, that's strange. He went into the room, checked that Madeline was still asleep in bed. She was and he came out, closed the door. He thinks that the abductor must have been in there hiding. All in all, there is a huge amount of talk about doors being open, closed, ajar at this or that angle. All of these statements, both by Jerry McCann and Dr. Oldfield, seem designed to give the Portuguese police the impression that an abductor had been in and out of the McCann's apartment. Matthew Oldfield's claim that he didn't go into the children's room and saw only saw the twins in their cots but not Madeline in her bed again seems tailor-made to fit with the other hints and suggestions that an abductor must have come in and out between Jerry McCann's last check at about 9 or 5 p.m., which I'll come on to in a moment, and Oldfield's check about 25 minutes later. There is therefore real cause for doubt as to whether this alleged check by Matthew Oldfield ever happened. Dr. Gonchalo Amaral, the original investigation coordinator, thought much the same in his book about the case, The Truth of the Lie. He wrote, Matthew Oldfield's statement happens to conveniently reinforce the hypothesis of an abduction and was meant to give weight to Jane Tanner's witness statement. Is there any proof that Madeline was alive on Thursday the 3rd of May at 10 p.m. when Kate said she found Madeline gone? We can say no, there is not. Or at 9.30 p.m. when Matthew Oldfield says he checked the McCann's apartment? No, there is not. So we now go back in time from Oldfield's claimed check at 9.25 p.m. to the visit Jerry McCann says he made to his apartment at 9.05 p.m. to 9.10 p.m. when he says he saw all three children sleeping happily. Can we accept this as proof that Madeline was alive? This is a statement made by one of Madeline's parents. We have already established that there is strong evidence that Madeline may have died in the apartment. If Madeline did die in the apartment, then Jerry McCann's statement that he saw Madeline on this occasion is known in law as a self-serving statement. In other words, it is of no evidential value whatsoever in a court of law. It has not been and cannot be corroborated. So we can safely now amend our timeline as follows. Between around 7 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. on the 3rd of May, the McCanns say they were with all three children feeding them, bathing them, reading stories to them, and putting them down to sleep. There are several inconsistencies of their accounts of this period. For example, they gave three different versions of who read bedtime stories to the children, Kate, or Jerry, or both. But once again, whatever the McCanns say about this period of time, it is just another set of self-serving statements which cannot be corroborated by anyone else. So we have now gone back to 7 p.m. and still found no proof that Madeline was alive. Now I come to the last time any third party is said to have seen the children, the alleged visit of David Payne to the McCann's apartment at around 6.30 to 7 p.m. on the 3rd of May. I dealt with this in great detail in part two of my film, The True Story of Madeline McCann. 
As I went through the statements of both Dr. David Payne and Kate McCann, I was able to identify an unbelievable 20 clear contradictions between their different versions of what happened. Here is a list of them. Kate McCann said Payne never came into the apartment. Payne said he calmly walked in and stayed there at least several minutes. Kate says she was in the shower at the time and hastily put on a towel to answer a knock at the door. Payne mentions nothing of this. Besides, a long-standing close friendship with the McCanns is not a neutral witness, so we can dismiss this claimed sighting, as indeed Dr. Conchalo Amaral also did in his book, and amend our timeline accordingly. Let's go back still further, another half hour, to yet another alleged proof that Madeline was alive early that evening. Namely the claim that there was video footage from the Pareso restaurant in Praia de Luz of Madeline dancing with her father at about 5.30pm to 6pm on the 3rd of May. It was solemnly reproduced as a fact on a regular basis in our mainstream press. What is the truth? Video footage allegedly showing Jerry McCann dancing with Madeline was produced by one Miguel Matias. Months later it was established, then later admitted by him, to be a fake. Some years previously Matias had been comprehensively exposed by a Portuguese newspaper journalist as a serial conman and fraudster who was known to the Portuguese police. So much for his bogus claim. So now we have gone back one stage further. Now we come on to an event which I'm going to deal with in some detail. That's because the senior detective who coordinated the original investigation into Madeline's disappearance, Dr. Conchalo Amaral, and his team believed that this event was sufficient proof that Madeline was alive at this point. I am referring to a claim by the McCanns and one of the creche nannies that Madeline was having high tea with them at around 5 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. on the day Madeline was reported missing. This is how Dr. Amaral has put it in his book. The minor Madeline McCann died inside apartment 5A of the Ocean Club in Praia de Luz on the night of the 3rd of May 2007. His senior detective inspector, Tavares de Almeida, wrote in his interim report, published three days after the McCanns were made suspects, the last time that the child was seen outside of the group by someone who can prove they saw her was around 5.35 p.m. when the parents went to pick her up at the creche. One Madeleine McCann researcher was so convinced that Madeleine was alive at the high tea that she wrote, According to all the evidence, Madeleine was alive when Kate signed her out of the tapas area at 5.30 p.m. on the 3rd of May 2007 so Madeline must have gone missing sometime between 5.30 p.m. and 10 p.m. that day. I'm now going to look into detail at the two creche nannies who say they can prove they saw her. Creche nanny Charlotte Pennington and another creche nanny Catriona or Cat Baker and examine the conflicting statements made about the alleged high tea. First, Madeline was supposedly looked after all that week by Cat Riona, Cat Baker. Let's first of all look, with the help of Cat Baker, at what creches there were that week and where they were located. Here is what she said to the Portuguese police. This type of childcare takes place in four different places according to the ages of the children. For children aged four months to one year, it is the Baby Club, which is close to the Ocean Club's main reception. For children aged one and two years, it is the Toddler Club, which is next to the Tapas Restaurant. The McCann's twins, Amelie and Sean, were in the Toddler Club. For children aged three to five, as Madeline was, they are placed in the Mini Club, which is also close to the Ocean Club's main reception, along with the Baby Club. And finally, for children aged six to nine years, and from ten to thirteen years, they attend the Junior Club which is close to the Millennium Restaurant. Concerning the operating hours, Cat Baker tells us that there are four separate services. 
mornings 9am till 12.30pm, afternoons 2.30pm till 5.30pm, the dining out service 7.30pm till 11.30pm, children are watched in a room above the main Ocean Club 24 hour reception. There is no extra charge for this service, but parents must take and fetch their own children. And the babysitting service, 7.30pm till 1am. Children are watched in their own apartments. There is an extra charge for this service. In Cat Baker's statement, it says, When asked, the informant, Cat Baker, responds that it was always the parents who brought Madeline and fetched her from the mini club. And Madeline was in the so-called Lobsters Mini Club group. We now know that for whatever reason the McCanns and their friends did not take up the offer of either of these evening childcare services. Cat Baker also refers to a high tea that she says was regularly taken at about 5.30pm with children, creche nannies and parents all present. She says this was taken elsewhere however, at the tapas bar. But there is real doubt about whether this alleged practice of high tea every day that week at 5.30pm was a regular fixture at all. Other witnesses do not confirm it. According to what we have been told, on that holiday the McCanns and their group took their children to their respective creches, one for the younger infants and toddlers and the other for the older infants at about 9 to 9.30 p.m., then took them out for lunch between 12.30 p.m. and 2.30 p.m., then put them back in their creches and arrived to collect them at about 5.30 p.m. As I've said, Madeline was in a small creche group called Lobsters, the one run by Cat Baker. Let's now move on to see what Kate McCann herself says in her book Madeline about the high tea on Thursday the 3rd of May. Having arranged for Jerry to meet the children, I opted to go for a run along the beach, where I spotted the rest of our holiday group. I remember being fleetingly disappointed that we hadn't known they were all heading for the beach, as it might have been nice to have joined them. I wondered whether Madeline had been okay about staying behind in the mini-club, the Lobsters, when Russ and Jane had collected Ella. I had finished my run at 5.30 at the tapas area, where I found Madeline and the twins already having their tea with Jerry. The others had decided to feed their kids at the beachside restaurant, the Pareso. So what are we being asked to believe here? First, that Kate, because she had gone for a run at this time, had pre-arranged for Jerry McCann to walk to collect Madeline from the lobster group at the Ocean Club 24-hour reception area, several minutes walk away from their apartment, and then walk back with Madeline to the place where the high tea was being held by the tapas bar. This must have happened all in good time for him to be sitting there happily eating high tea with the children at the tapas bar as Kate presumably jogged or walked back to join them all from the beach in her running gear after completing her run. Second, we're asked to believe that all the rest of their Tapa 7 group of friends had apparently decided not to bother about the high tea, instead taking all their children to the beach at the Pareso restaurant for the afternoon. Kate claims she was a touch put out by this. Let's go on to consider what Kate says about what happened next. Madeline was sitting on the tapas terrace, eating. She looked so pale and worn out, I went straight up to her and asked if she was all right. Had she been okay at the club when Ella left to go to the beach? Yes, she said, but now she was really tired and wanted me to pick her up, which I did. Ten minutes later, the five of us went back to our apartment. I was carrying Madeline. Because she was so exhausted, we skipped playtime that evening. Later, however, Kate was to tell the world that Madeline told her before going to bed that this had been the best day of my life, a claim that doesn't somehow ring true. Does a three-year-old really say things like that? And would she say that after she had not been able to play with her friend Ella that afternoon, and when, according to Kate, she was pale, tired and worn out? She says, the five of us went back to the apartment. It would surely be more natural to just say, we went back to the apartment. Why does she have to emphasise the five of us? But even more curious is Kate's claim that she and Jerry all walked back to their apartment, but that she was carrying Madeline, not Jerry. 
Madeline would probably have weighed at least two and a half stone at that time. Why wasn't Jerry carrying Madeline? Just as relevant, Cat Baker doesn't mention anything about Madeline looking unwell or so pale, worn out and exhausted as Kate McCann claims. Here is a suggestion that I suggest fits the known facts. If indeed Madeline was already dead by Thursday, then probably Jerry McCann would have collected the twins from the crash that afternoon. Perhaps that is why the two of them may have concocted this story about carrying two and a half stone Madeline by herself back to the apartment on her own, and then the pair of them entering by different doors. Now let's look at what the written crash records have to say about that afternoon. These records purport to be accurate records of when the parents delivered the children to and collected them from their respective creches. Let's look at the record of Amelie and Sean, who were in the other creche called Jellyfish. Here we see Kate's actual signature, giving the time she took the twins out of the creche at 5.25pm. The column Parents' Location has been redacted on these documents as these are the parents' private telephone numbers. It also seems from this record that there were only three children that day in the group run by Stacy or Sinead. As a matter of interest, the record for that group in the morning of the 3rd of May is missing from the crash records handed to the Portuguese police. So now we come to the record that day for Madeline's group, the Lobsters, run by Nanny Cat Baker. Here once again we see what is clearly Kate McCann's signature, K. McCann. She gives the time of collecting Madeline as 5.30pm. In each case on the sheets she uses the continental style of writing 7, thus 7. So how do these crash records reconcile with what we saw just now? That she says in her book, having arranged for Jerry to meet the children, I had finished my run by 5.30 at the tapas area, where I found Madeline and the twins already having their tea with Jerry. She says nothing in her book about first collecting the twins, but the crash records say that she did at 5.25pm. So why this clear contradiction? She quite clearly says she went straight to the tapas area, and she says that Madeline and the twins were already having tea with Jerry. At this point I should mention that in none of his statements does Jerry McCann state that he himself went to collect Madeline from the lobsters group at the Ocean Club reception and then returned back to the tapas area for the high tea. Now I go back to the signatures on the crash records. If, as Kate maintains in her book, it was Jerry who collected the children, and that by the time she had finished her run along the beach they were all in the tapas area and not in their creches, then why is her signature on the crash records that afternoon and not Jerry's? What we can surely say is that either the McCanns are not telling the truth about this event, or the crash records are wrong, or maybe both are wrong. Later I'll examine whether some of the crash records may have been forged. Another point of interest is that Jerry is said to have come to collect the children straight from the tennis courts, whereas presumably Kate arrived at the crash or the tapas area after what by all accounts was a very long run. Cat Baker does say that she thinks that Kate arrived to the high tea in her sports clothes, but says nothing about what Jerry was wearing and Cat Baker seems vague about that day's events. Asked who dropped Madeline off at the creche that afternoon, she says she doesn't know. Asked who picked Madeline up from the creche at lunchtime, she answers, I can't remember. How can she be so vague about the events of that most momentous day of her life? Let's now probe what other evidence there is there really was this alleged high tea event with the McCanns, their three children and Cat Baker. I've looked at all the other witness statements for this day and have found the following. No other parent at the holiday says they were having high tea with the children in the tapas area that afternoon. Cat Baker, Madeline's crash nanny, says that Madeline was at high tea from 1525 to 1800. Maybe it is a mistake by using the 24-hour clock. Possibly she meant to say 5.25pm to 6pm. Cat Baker also claims that Madeline was in the lobster group that morning and went with the sailing group in the morning for the so-called mini-sail. Cat Baker says in her statement that Madeline was picked up that afternoon by Kate, not Jerry, once again contradicting Kate McCann's account in her book. 
that she went straight to the tapas area, where she said the three children and Jerry were already having high tea together. An ocean club worker, Geronimo Salcidas, made an informal statement on the 4th of May, the day after Madeline was reported missing, claiming he saw Madeline at 4.45pm near the tapas bar. This statement does not harmonise with any other statements about Madeline that afternoon. But then two days later, when he made his formal statement, he said that he cannot be sure if he had seen Madeline or the twins. It's a statement whose evidential value is therefore worthless. There is also a statement by Maria Manuela Antonio Jose, a tapas bar cook. She claims to have seen Madeline having a meal in the tapas area around 4.30pm, as she says she did every day. Again though, this statement conflicts with other evidence, so we can reject it. None of the waiters in the tapas area could remember serving any children high tea on the 3rd of May. I conclude from the above that apart from the contradictory evidence from Jerry McCann, Kate McCann and the creche nanny Kat Baker that there is no other credible evidence that this so-called high tea allegedly with Madeline present actually took place. Another creche worker who claims to have seen Madeline that week is Charlotte Pennington. She gave a statement to the Portuguese police on Monday the 7th of May. This is what she says, that she worked with the younger infants group called the Baby Club. It was divided into three subgroups. She was responsible for one of those groups. She says that the physical space where the children's groups are located is contiguous, so that in the course of her work she came across Madeleine McCann and her group the Mini Club many times. She sometimes took part with the Mini Club group. This would be between 9am and 10.30am and 2.30pm and 3pm. She remembers telling Madeline stories and speaking with her on two specific occasions. One was on Sunday the 29th of April, the other on Thursday the 3rd of May. She gives no times of day for these events and she says nothing about seeing Madeline at the alleged high tea. She describes Madeline as a child who conversed normally for her age and was of a calm demeanour. She adds that it was usual for Madeline to be called Maddie, as this is how she, Madeline, presented herself to the witness. She says that Madeline was normally left by her parents around 9.15am at the creche, as her parents usually left the twins beforehand at the toddler club. She says that she is not aware of any situation that seemed odd or strange related directly or indirectly to the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. But over four months later, Charlotte Pennington made an appearance in a lengthy Daily Mail article by Dan Newling on the 25th of September 2007. The article was headlined, Kate did scream they've taken her, claims a new nanny witness. The new witness was Charlotte Pennington. Now that's very strange because she doesn't mention this new significant detail about Kate screaming they've taken her in her statement to the Portuguese police. We only start hearing from Pennington in media reports in late September. Why didn't Pennington mention this issue described as pivotal by the Daily Mail when she was first questioned? If the Mail article is correct, this is an important reason for questioning whether she is a truthful witness. Let's see what the article says. She dismissed claims that the McCanns were not seen for six hours leading up to the disappearance. She said, I was helping give the children high tea. The twins were there and Madeline and both parents. It was supposed to finish at 5.30pm, but because they were a big group and really social, it didn't finish until about 6pm. There was nothing out of the ordinary at all. So, a second time, according to the mail, Charlotte Pennington has apparently remembered something that she failed to mention to the Portuguese police in her first statement. The background to the Daily Mail article is that for a couple of weeks the Portuguese and British newspapers were speculating about the so-called missing six hours between about 2pm and 8pm on the day Madeline disappeared. This was said to be a period when the McCanns could not properly account for what they were doing. So, in response, it seems the McCann team, no doubt with the help of Clarence Mitchell, planted many stories in the British mainstream press trying to explain these missing six hours.
This article featuring Charlotte Pennington was just one of many. So what exactly is Miss Pennington reported as saying in these articles about the high tea? The article says she was there, she helped to give the children high tea, both parents, Madeline and the children were there, the high tea was supposed to finish at 5.30pm, because everyone was enjoying it, it carried on till 6pm, it was a big group. Apart from the fact that we need to explain why Pennington didn't mention this when first questioned, this story doesn't match at all with what either Kate McCann or Cat Baker said about it. Kate McCann talks of Madeline and the twins already having tea with Jerry when she arrived at 5.30pm. She says the high tea was supposed to finish at 5.30pm, yet Kate says she only just got there at 5.30pm after her run on the beach. Neither Kate McCann nor Jerry McCann nor Cat Baker make mention of other children or big group of children and parents which the Charlotte Pennington article states. Moreover, neither Kate McCann nor Jerry McCann nor Cat Baker say that Charlotte Pennington was at this high tea, yet another contradiction. We also saw earlier that none of the waiters recollect a group of parents and children having high tea that day and no parent who was on holiday that week mentions being at this alleged high tea with their children either. As we examine the evidence, it looks as though this alleged high tea event could be an invention, first by the McCanns, and then second by Cat Baker, and finally by Charlotte Pennington, at least according to the Daily Mail article featuring her. And now I want to bring in what Jerry McCann himself said about the supposed event when he was questioned for the second time by the Portuguese police on the 10th of May. He certainly said nothing about it in his first statement on the 4th of May. Here is an extract from his second statement. The deponent and Kate returned to the Ocean Club by the shortcut and at the secondary reception they asked the lady employee if there was a vacant tennis court they could reserve. They were told there was a vacancy between 1430 and 1530. As it was already 1500, they began to play immediately. At 1530, the tennis instructor arrived, who instructed each of them until 1630. They stayed in that place, talking until 1645, at which time the twins went to the meal area. At 1700, as usual, Madeline arrived accompanied by the teachers and the other children. After her arrival, Madeline ate the meal, having ended at 1730. After 1730, they went to the apartment, the deponent having entered by the main door, which he did not lock while he was inside the residence. Kate and the children entered by the rear door, after this had been opened from the inside by the deponent. So here, Jerry McCann tells the police that he and his wife played tennis until 4.30pm. Then they hung around on the courts until 4.45pm, at which time the twins were presumably brought by the crash worker to the tapas area, and they went there to meet them. He says Madeline arrived with the crash nanny and others at 5pm, and they all had tea together, leaving for their apartment at 5.30pm. Perhaps the first thing we note about this account is that it is wholly at variance with what Kate McCann says in her book. She says she was running on the beach at 5.15pm, while Jerry says they played tennis and then went together to the tapas area at 4.45pm. No mention of Kate's long jog at the beach. Then we recall that Kate said that Jerry was already with the children when she arrived back from her run, direct to the tapas bar, and then met up with the children and Jerry. But Jerry in his statement says that he and Kate were already together. Jerry says that the teachers, he means the nannies, brought the children to the tapas area. But then we remember that the crash entries apparently signed by Kate McCann show Kate McCann taking the twins out of the crash at 5.25pm and again Kate McCann taking Madeline out of her crash at 5.30pm. Yet Jerry says in his statement that the twins left the crash at 4.45pm, a full 40 minutes before Kate. It has been suggested that the parents would all sign the crash records at the tapas area rather than when they collected the children from the clubs. If that were the case, then according to what Kate, Jerry and the two nannies all say, surely the crash register 
would have all three children signed out later than 5.30 p.m., which according to Kate McCann is the time she had only just arrived. All parties claim that this high tea went on to 6 p.m. Jerry, in his statement, says that Madeline left her crèche and arrived at the high tea at 5 p.m. But how can that be reconciled with the crèche records, which show Kate McCann collecting her at 5.30 p.m.? We have examined several irreconcilable witness statements about this alleged high tea. Jerry McCann solemnly gives a considered statement about the events of that late afternoon to the Portuguese police on the 10th of May 2007. Almost exactly four years later, Kate McCann publishes a book which she claims is her version of the truth, yet it contradicts her husband's statement in several important respects. The creche nannies don't agree with what the McCanns say about the high tea, and the nannies don't appear to agree with each other about it. So what are we to make of this? Did the high tea happen? Let's look, for example, at what one long-time Madeleine McCann researcher, Lizzie Taylor, a British expat now working in Canada, has to say about the high tea. She makes these points. Jerry McCann claims to have been at high tea while the children were there and Kate arrived after her jog at approximately 5.30pm. Catriona the nanny claims that Jerry wasn't there and that he was playing tennis, which is very odd, as who would have told her that and when? Kate consistently claims that Madeline was very tired and Madeline asked her mother to carry her home. Kate then carried her back to the apartment, but Jerry claims they went to the patio doors and he let them in through the back. If indeed Kate had been carrying Madeline, how did she manage the twins on her own, climbing the steep steps at the rear of the apartment? This was a few hours before Madeline disappeared, and yet Kate claims she went in through the front doors. What mother would not remember the door used three hours before she claims she saw her daughter for the last time? Was it Jerry that got it wrong? Did they really go back to the apartment at that time? They can't agree on what door was used even the following morning when they gave their statements. I suggest we simply cannot accept any of this evidence as any kind of proof that Madeline did have high tea with her brother, sister and parents. And on that very important evidential matter, I respectfully have to say that Conchalo Amaral and his team of detectives working under an international media spotlight and being fed one contradiction after another by the McCanns and their friends may have been misled. As a result of this belief that they were telling him the truth, Conchalo Amaral formulated the view that Madeline died from some kind of accident in the McCann's apartment sometime after 6 p.m. on the 3rd of May. But I suggest that based on the evidence we have examined about the high tea, it clearly does not provide credible evidence of Madeline being alive at this time. So this is where we've now arrived with our timeline. So then, were there any more reported sightings of Madeline that afternoon? The answer is yes, there were two. One of these, a photograph allegedly at 2.29pm that afternoon, is crucial. But first, let's deal with the other one. An alleged photograph taken by another parent on holiday, Philip Martin Edmonds. He and his wife were apparently divorced. He had gone to Praia de Luz that week with his three boys, aged between six and ten. He was on holiday in Praia de Luz for the very same week as the McCanns. I hope to be having a look in more detail in my next film about Madeline at some of the interesting names on the guest list that week, and what this might mean. Edmonds was and is on the board of directors of one of the world's largest steel firms, Stemco Limited, with an annual turnover of billions of pounds. The company has offices and factories in several countries, including the UK and Switzerland. 
Edmonds at the time appeared to be dividing his time between the two countries. At some point when the debate in the press was raging about the missing six hours on the 3rd of May, for which the McCanns appeared to be unable to account for, Several articles appeared in the British press claiming that Edmonds had a photograph of his three boys playing happily on the grass in the Ocean Club playground on Thursday the 3rd of May, the very date Madeline was reported missing, with Madeline somewhere in the background. But this photograph, allegedly proving that Madeline was still alive at that time, has never been produced to my knowledge. Back in 2011, a Madeleine McCann researcher wrote to Edmonds and asked him about this photograph. Here, first of all, is the letter. The question was asked, I am wondering, therefore, if you would kindly be able to tell me whether you or any member of your family had any contact with the McCanns and their children on Thursday the 3rd of May, and also whether you have any photographs of Madeleine taken on that specific day. This drew this response from Mr. Edmonds. I am in receipt of your letter of 22nd of July regarding Madeleine McCann. I am sure you would appreciate that it would not be appropriate for me to comment too much, as we do not know each other and I have no idea what your connection to the case is. However, I would not want further conspiracy theories to fester by simply ignoring your letter. Therefore I can confirm that whatever information I had, including some photographs of my sons taken on the day Madeline disappeared, which showed her in the background, was passed both to the police and to the McCanns at the time. Having been in Portugal at the time of Madeline's disappearance, and seen all of the events first hand, there is not one shred of doubt in my mind that the events as reported were correct. In fact, one of the most terrible parts of this tragedy is that there are people out there who are questioning this, just adding further to the nightmare that the McCann family have suffered. I cannot imagine anything crueler. I am afraid I won't enter into further correspondence on this matter with you. And that was that. Except perhaps to mention his connection to Labour Party grandee Lady Margaret Hodge, a member of the rich, well-connected and powerful Oppenheimer family, who is Edmund's aunt. Philip Edmund's uncle is Ralph Oppenheimer, who was also on the STEMCOR board. Indeed, STEMCOR, as a brief internet search reveals, is an Oppenheimer family business. Philip Edmund's father Herbert Edmund's had married Hannah, the daughter of Hans Lisbeth Oppenheimer. Hodge, of course, was a leading Labour councillor in Islington, where she became notorious for covering up extensive child abuse in what became known as the Islington Children's Home Scandal fully exposed in the 1990s. In 2003, despite this appalling record, Prime Minister Tony Blair made her Britain's first ever Minister for Children. Now Lady Margaret Hodge was a very close associate of Lord Levy. Both headed up Tony Blair's notorious fundraising team, with various celebrities like Bernie Eccleston invited to donate to the Labour Party in return for being made Lords a few weeks later. Lord Levy was questioned under caution by the Met Police during the affair, but the police never pressed charges. Interestingly, Dame Vivian Duffy was one of the major donors to the Labour Party at this time. She is a patron of the charity Missing People, which four years ago made Kate McCann one of their ambassadors, a strange choice given her admission that she and her husband were prepared to leave three young children under four on their own while they went out whining and dining. Why a very wealthy and well-connected man like Philip Edmonds should choose the rather rudimentary resort of Pride de Luz as his holiday venue for that week, 28th of April to the 5th of May, is unclear. But what is clear is that this photograph, if it exists, has never been published to my knowledge. I suggest that if there really was a photograph of Madeline that could be proved to have been taken on the 3rd of May, we would have seen it by now. Now let's go on to examine a photograph that is said to provide absolute proof that Madeline was alive that afternoon, taken, it is claimed, at precisely 2.29pm on the 3rd of May, the famous so-called last photo of Jerry McCann, Madeline and her younger sister, Amelie. Step by step, 
I am going to show you evidence that this photograph was most likely taken four days earlier than claimed, that is, on Sunday the 29th of April. If I am right, then the purported date and time of the photograph is a forgery, and if so, that makes it a criminal offence in both Portugal and England, and especially so if this forgery was deliberately created to prevent the police finding out what really happened to a missing three-year-old. I am also going to suggest that there are no photos whatsoever of Madeline alive after Sunday that week, only the second day of her holiday, and after that I will examine other evidence which suggests that there is no other credible proof that Madeline was alive after that first Sunday. But first, I want to mention two very strange features about the McCann's holiday that week. The first is that there are only five still photographs of Madeline that week which have been made available to the police and public, apart from the one Philip Edmonds claimed to have taken, which has never been shown to my knowledge. Why just five? There are also two short video clips of the family on the way to the plane that took them to Portugal on Saturday the 28th of April. The second mystery is why, when the police asked for a sample of Madeline's DNA, the McCanns were unable to produce any. They had nothing, apparently, neither on her clothes, nor her bedclothes, nor pillows, soft toys, or things like hairbrush or toothbrush that would yield any of her DNA. That is remarkable, and could indicate the McCanns sterilised the clothes and belongings of Madeline before she was reported missing. The McCanns actually maintained that Madeline shared her toothbrush with her younger sister Amelie, thus meaning that the police couldn't take a sample from it. I have to say, I personally do not believe that children in a family like this one would share a toothbrush. In fact, to get any of Madeline's DNA, the police had to wait for three weeks after Madeline was reported missing when Jerry McCann returned to England for a weekend. One of his tasks was to find some of Madeline's DNA. He did so by producing Madeline's pillow for a DNA test to a Leicestershire police officer. Quite why Madeline's DNA could be found on a pillow in Rothley three weeks after she was reported missing, and not on the pillow she was supposedly sleeping on the night she was allegedly abducted, has never been explained. Let me now deal with these five photos that we do have very briefly. Here they are. There are three of Madeline playing in the grounds of the Ocean Club. This first one shows her playing with Jerry McCann and is generally called the playground photo. Now the McCanns in a handout once described this and the other two photographs taken in the Ocean Club play area as having been taken on the afternoon of Wednesday the 2nd of May, the day before she was reported missing. There is, however, no credible evidence to support this, apart from their own words. On these three images, Madeline appears to be wearing the same clothes as she was on the videos of her in the airport bus and boarding the plane, except that possibly she might have had a change of trousers. Sean is dressed exactly the same as on the airport bus videos, Moreover, the photographs fit perfectly with what we are told happened on that first afternoon after the McCann family arrived in Pride de Luz. After unpacking in mid-afternoon, they and their friends went down to the Ocean Club playground. The shadows on the photo are quite long, suggesting they may have been taken sometime between 5pm and 7pm late afternoon, early evening. Here are the other two photos of Madeline playing at a Wendy house in the Ocean Club playground. There is no sun on these two pictures, but that is entirely consistent with what we know about the weather that day. Here is a photo taken early evening on Saturday the 28th of April, around the same time on Saturday that I believe these photos of Madeline were taken. You can clearly see plenty of blue sky, but also fluffy, broken clouds. Weather charts for that day show light cloud from 2pm until 6pm. The pictures of Madeline by the Wendy House were taken during a period of cloud cover on an otherwise sunny day. Every available indication from these three photographs and from what we know for certain about the McCann's movements that day tell us that they were probably taken late afternoon on the first day of their holiday. They are wholly consistent with Madeline running around and enjoying herself in her new surroundings. 
I personally believe there is a very high degree of certainty that all these three images were all taken on Saturday the 28th of April, not the Wednesday as the McCanns claim. This is accepted by many Madeleine McCann researchers. So these three photos could prove Madeleine was alive at least on the first day of the holiday, Saturday the 28th of April. The fourth picture is this one, Madeleine on the tennis court, the so-called tennis balls photo, which Kate McCann writes about at some length in her book. This picture is curious in several respects. I personally cannot be sure that this is a genuine photo. To illustrate what might be wrong with this photo, I am going to play a 50 second clip about it, made by Madeleine McCann campaigner Lizzie Taylor and now on YouTube, called Discrepancies, Madeleine's Mini Tennis. What is brought out in this clip is that two different people claim to have taken the photograph. As the video progresses, an even more startling discrepancy emerges. Kate McCann insists she took the tennis balls photo on the Tuesday at the children's mini tennis session. But the McCann's friend, Rachel Oldfield, says the photograph was taken while Madeline was playing tennis on the Thursday of that week, the very day she was reported missing. This is what Rachel Oldfield says in her statement. The 3rd of May was different to the others because, well, it was warmer weather-wise. Um, we went to the Millennium for breakfast as usual. Um, we did that every day. Jerry and Kate didn't. It was just too far for them to go with the twins. So they didn't ever go for breakfast up there, I think apart from the first morning. Matt and I had a tennis lesson at 11 o'clock. I just sat by the pool and read my book. Kate was there and we sat together and chatted a bit. Then I think it must have been about 10.30, Madeline and Ella and their sort of group came to have a tennis lesson as part of their crash activities. Um, and Kate didn't have a camera. And Jane was there then as well. And Jane took some photos of both Madeline and Ella. That's one, the poster of Madeline with the tennis balls. So Kate says she ran back and took the picture. Rachel says Jane took the tennis balls picture. But remember also the claim by Rachel that Madeline was having a tennis lesson that morning, because as we shall see later on, Madeline's crash nanny, Catriona Baker, tells an entirely different story about what Madeline was doing that morning. These are not the only two issues about this photograph. First, where is everybody else? There is no one else in shot. Second, if three-year-old children were supposed to be playing mini tennis at this time, why do we see proper tennis balls being carried and not these soft balls that might be used for such young children? Third, where are all the loose balls supposedly being collected? Fourth, Kate McCann describes the photo in her book in what seems unnecessary detail. For example, that Madeline was keen to try on her new shoes and how gorgeous she looked in her t-shirt and shorts. She also states that when Madeline was playing tennis, she didn't have her camera with her. She says she was so overwhelmed at how gorgeous Madeline looked that she ran back to her apartment, collected her camera and rushed back to take this picture. It's a strange story because the time she had allegedly rushed back to collect her camera and returned, several minutes would have elapsed and the moment would have been lost. We don't have any more tennis ball photos, just this one. Did she only take that one? It's curious that we appear to have no other photographs of Madeline after the ones taken on, I believe, Saturday, apart from this one, and the so-called last photo, which I'll come on to in just a moment. But fifth, there are some indications that this photo might have been photoshopped.
I suggest that the body of the girl looks like that of a child older than three. She appears to have a very red right arm, possibly with some scratch marks, which are unexplained. It is certainly Madeline's head, but has that possibly been photoshopped onto the photo of another girl altogether? Some have suggested that the head looks slightly too far to the right of where it should be. Also, if we look at the last photo for a moment, we see that Madeline has a very pale skin. Can this really be the same body that we see in the tennis balls photo, where she looks not only tanned but quite red in places? Then we have a question mark about the girl's shoes. She is not wearing the shoes that we saw her wearing in the photos from the playground. She is wearing white sandals. Kate McCann in her book unnecessarily describes what she says Madeline was wearing. She looked so gorgeous in her little t-shirt and shorts, pink hat, ankle socks and new holiday sandals. Is she trying too hard to convince us that the tennis ball's photo really is Madeline? I don't know if it's been photoshopped, but what I can say is that I'm not prepared to accept this photo is what it purports to be. If two different people are supposed to have taken it, and it's supposed to have been taken on two different days. So we cannot use this photo as proof that Madeline was alive either on the Thursday or the Tuesday. None of the four photos we've looked at prove that she was alive after the first day of the holiday. So now I come to the puzzle surrounding this so-called last photo. Jerry McCann, Amelie and Madeline sitting by the poolside, said to have been taken at 2.29pm precisely on Thursday the 3rd of May. It has been reproduced hundreds of times on TV and in the newspapers. An image just of Madeline cropped from that photo has been displayed even more often. There's nothing else of Madeline that week. Just the three photos taken on the first day, then there is the strange tennis balls photo which we looked at just now, and now the fifth one, this so-called last photo. Only four or perhaps five photos for the whole of that week. That fact alone seems curious. The photo is a charming image of Madeline. She is clearly seeing the funny side of something, maybe sharing a joke with someone. Her father may look a bit sombre, but Madeline looks like a carefree young three-year-old thoroughly enjoying her holiday. The McCanns say the picture was taken by Kate McCann, who had her son Sean, Amelie's twin, beside her as the photo was taken. That seems very probable. The four pictures that we can be certain were taken on that holiday certainly show Madeline having fun running around the playground. But where are all the other photographs? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. No photos except for the controversial tennis balls photo and the last photo. Do any more exist? It seems inexplicable. But I think there is an explanation. Let's see what it might be. First question, was this last photo of Madeline released straight away by the McCanns? No, it wasn't. It didn't see the light of day for a further three weeks. Let's look at this issue very closely. When the alarm was raised about Madeline by the McCanns at about 10pm on Thursday the 3rd of May, clearly this photo was in the McCanns' camera. Not only that, but if we look at the photos taken by the Portuguese police that night, there is a camera, bold as brass, lying on the living room table. Now if the Portuguese police and the general public wanted to know what Madeline looked like, as indeed they did, what better photograph could there be than this one? Taken only hours, so it is said, before she was reported missing. But, most strangely, the McCanns and fellow members of their Tapa 7 didn't use it when giving out a photograph of Madeline to the police that night. Why not? So, before I go on to analyse that so-called last photo of Madeline in more detail, let's examine another very strange affair and look at what actual first photograph they did produce for the police the night they reported Madeline missing. This is it. And the very first thing we observe about this photo is that it is not from the holiday and appears to be a much younger Madeline, possibly having been taken a year or even more earlier. 
Here are some other, much earlier photographs of Madeline for comparison. It is just one of the great puzzles of this case. Why, with a last photo like the one we've just been looking at, did they not use that one, but instead showed this one, which I'll call the first photo, by which I mean the first one to be released. According to the evidence of Jerry McCann, his Tapas 7 friend, Russell O'Brien, and one of the creche nannies, Amy Tierney, produced copies of this photo, which was on an SD memory card. They allegedly used a small printer belonging to Amy Tierney's boyfriend. It seems, from their statements, that Jerry McCann had with him not only an SD card with photos of his current holiday on it, but he was actually carrying another SD card or USB stick around with him which had much older photographs of Madeline and the children on it. Or was he? I suppose it is also possible that he had kept his old photographs of Madeline on his current SD card. Let's start by examining what the creche nanny, Amy Tierney, had to say about all this when she was questioned. Here is her first statement and I'll read out the relevant paragraphs. She confirms that on the night of the disappearance she was on duty and immediately went to the bedroom to see if the girl was hiding. She saw that the shutter was raised and that the window was partially open. It was then that she began to look in the wardrobe to see if the girl was hiding. The first idea that occurred to her was that the girl could have left by her own means. However, after checking that the window was open and the shutter raised, she asked the parents whether Madeline's shoes were there, to which they replied that they were. These facts led her to think that Madeline could have been taken by someone. However, there was a bed against the window which could have enabled the girl to climb up onto it and then up to the window. The witness thinks it would not be possible, as she would not be able to open the shutters, and even if she had done so, she would have fallen outside, as the window was too high for a child of that age to be able to descend without falling. The witness confirms that the girl's father went to the reception to call the police as soon as her disappearance was noticed, and that twenty minutes had passed. The GNR took thirty to thirty-five minutes to arrive. Amy Tierney was quickly at the McCann's apartment after the alarm was raised, helped in the search for Madeline, had time to note the arrangement of the children's bedroom, and then her statement tells us how Jerry McCann went to the main Ocean Club reception area to report Madeline missing. But tellingly, in that very first statement of hers, there is no mention whatsoever of her role that night in producing photos of Madeline for the police. It was not until nearly a year later, 17th of April 2008, that she made a further statement when she told the Leicestershire Police this, as part of a series of so-called rogatory interviews conducted by the British Police on behalf of the Portuguese Police. When questioned and shown the photographs referred to in the previous statements depicting the English girl on Kodak Extra Life paper, 10 centimetres by 15 centimetres, she stated they were printed on her printer also a Kodak brand. One of the friends of the McCann couple, Russell, asked for a USB memory stick reader in order to print photographs of Madeline. Immediately the deponent replied that she did not have a USB reader, but that she had a printer with this hardware which could read from memory sticks. She went to her room and returned to the tapas with the printer where she printed out 20 to 30 photographs of the girl using her own paper in 10 by 15 format mentioned previously. The memory stick containing the photos belonged to the McCann couple and came from their camera. She thinks that all of this took place at about midnight on the 3rd of May 2007. She presumes that she handed all of the photos to Russell who distributed them to those present, the rest would be for the police authorities. 
As regards her printer, she says that it is no longer in her possession and it is now with her boyfriend in France. She says, after consultation and in accordance with her previous statements, that it was a Kodak model Easy Share G60 of Thermalink transfer with continuous tonality. So, examining that statement, we learn the following. 1. The McCann's friend, Russell O'Brien, at about midnight, went to the Ocean Club reception when Amy Tierney was at her desk in the tapas bar. She was a nanny. What work exactly was she doing at a desk at midnight? She says he asked her for a USB memory stick reader so he could print photographs of Madeline. That means that he, or someone in his group, had a printer available or access to a printer. But why not simply hand the USB stick to the police? Amy Tierney says she hasn't got a memory stick reader, but she can print them on her own printer. She describes this as a Kodak model Easy Share G60. So she says clearly that this was her own printer, not someone else's. 4. The memory stick, or the photos on it, was from the McCann's camera, not that of Russell O'Brien. So there we have it. These pictures were taken from a memory stick belonging to the McCann's. 5. Finally, she now says that actually the printer was not hers, but was her boyfriend's, and that he and the printer are now in France. And that last point means that her story about whether these early photos of Madeleine were actually printed on this printer can't be verified. We also might note that she comes over vague towards the end of her statement. She says that she thinks that all of this took place at about midnight. She says she presumes that she handed all of the photos to Russell O'Brien. Does she not clearly remember these things from the fateful night? And she had had plenty of time to prepare for this re-interview in 2008. She goes on to say that Russell O'Brien distributed the photos to those present, but doesn't tell us who those present actually were. She says the rest of the photos would be for the police but she makes no mention of the police ever asking for the photos. The use of would-be is also a sign of possible deception. A truthful person would simply have said these photos were for the police. All in all, when we look at her statement and at the same time recall that she never mentioned anything about helping to produce these photos when first questioned, we are left with serious doubts about whether she is telling us the truth. Here surely is a deep mystery. The McCanns decide on the need for a photo to help in the search for Madeline. They have an up-to-date one taken just hours earlier. Yet they choose this one. Her hair is cut shorter both around her forehead and at the sides. But much more important than that, it is of a much younger Madeline. On the day Madeline was reported missing, she was just nine days short of her fourth birthday. Yet if we look through assorted photos of Madeline, which the McCanns have produced over the years, we can deduce that Madeline was probably no more than two and a half to three years old when this photo was taken. Why would the parents want people at the Ocean Club and staying in the village to see a photo taken maybe up to 18 months ago, when they had one taken hours ago, and certainly also those three playground photos of her earlier in the week? It makes no sense at all. It cries out for a convincing explanation. But let's now return to Amy Tierney's account of the printing of those photos. The camera seen on the table in the McCann's apartment is a Canon power shot. Some other photos were taken by their friends, the Paynes, possibly with an Olympus camera. Experts have advised me that you could not use either the Canon camera or the Olympus to print direct from camera the photograph we're calling the first photo. The printer, if the camera itself is docked on the printer, can print from a USB key. However, I am informed that such a small printer, as was claimed to have been used, would be unlikely to be able to print as many as 30 copies without running out of ink. Moreover, the paper that was used to print those photos does not appear to have been readily available in that area of Portugal at that time. The aspect ratio of this photograph is wrong for the Canon. It seems then that if there ever was a USB key given by Russell O'Brien to Amy Tierney then it must already have had this first photo on it before they went on holiday. Both Russell O'Brien and Amy Tierney talk about 
just one photo, just one pose. But Russell O'Brien, in his evidence, seems to be talking of a different photo of Madeline, one of her in a bright red dress. But the plot thickens. Both witnesses, Russell O'Brien and Amy Tierney, speak only of one photo. But in fact, there were two photos. This one, of Madeline in a red dress, was released a day or two later, and when Russell O'Brien is questioned about the first photo a year later, he mixes it up with the red dress photo. Yet a further problem arises when we look at when the first police officers arrive, and at the statement of one of the senior staff, Sylvia Batista. The first police to arrive on the scene were the local GNR. They arrived at about 11.10pm. They are handed copies of this out-of-date picture of Madeline, the so-called first photo, soon after they arrive. The statement of Sylvia Batista makes clear that the photos were handed to the police well before midnight. So it looks, for a start, as though Amy Tierney was probably wrong in claiming that she was approached at midnight and only then went to get her boyfriend's printer and start printing. She says was approached at her desk at midnight. What was she doing behind a desk at midnight has never been explained. According to her evidence, she then has to go to her room, get the printer, return to the tapas bar, and then set up the printer and paper. All of that might take several minutes. We know that the Kodak printer takes some time to print each photo, as much as 90 seconds. If she printed off 30 photos, as is claimed, that alone would take at least three quarters of an hour. The more we study this, there is an obvious contradiction between Sylvia Batista's evidence that she handed out these 6x4 pictures well before midnight and the claims made by Russell O'Brien and Amy Tierney that they only started trying to get these pictures printed on a small Kodak printer after midnight. Russell O'Brien was questioned extensively about his role in producing these photos of Madeline in four separate sessions at Leicestershire Police Headquarters on the 8th of April 2008, and two days later on the 10th. Throughout the questioning, Russell O'Brien refers to just one photo, and as we saw, he described a different photo, the one of Madeline in a red dress, which was released separately a couple of days after Madeline was reported missing. Still more puzzling, when he tries to recollect what happened that night, he makes no mention whatsoever of anything about a USB key, or even of Amy Tierney, the nanny who supposedly helped him print the photos, instead stating that it was another nanny, Catriona Baker, Madeline's nanny in the Lobster Group. You would think that since Russell O'Brien signed his own daughter into the very same crash as Madeline that week, he should be able to tell Amy Tierney from Cat Baker. Throughout his many interviews with the police over those two days, he is vague and evasive. He claims he cannot really remember what photo it was, stating that he'd seen so many that week. Yet the village of Praia de Luz and the surrounding areas were plastered with hundreds of posters made from this first photo for weeks, so it's rather strange that he can't remember the right one. Could both Russell O'Brien and Amy Tierney be lying about their claims of printing off these photos after midnight on a Kodak printer? It was one of the questions the Portuguese police became interested in long after the early frantic searches for Madeleine were over. It was on the 17th of April 2008, nearly a full year after Madeleine went missing, that Amy Tierney was questioned by Leicestershire Police. The police report tells us, as regards her printer, she says that it is no longer in her possession, as it is now with her boyfriend in France. And that was the end of that. Her story about her printer having been used that night could simply not be verified. Amy Tierney was interviewed by Leicestershire Police on the 17th of April, just a week after Russell O'Brien was interrogated on the 8th and 10th of April. Contrary to Russell O'Brien's evidence that the nanny he gave the USB stick to was Katrina, she confirms that it was she, Amy Tierney, to whom Russell O'Brien handed her the USB key. But we have one other piece of evidence that this whole story is probably bogus. Contrary to claims that Russell O'Brien was busy supervising the printing of the photographs between midnight and 1am, 
On his own admission, he was busy at the time in the McCann's apartment writing out two different timelines of the evening's events on the inside cover of Madeline's activity sticker book and handing them to the second set of Portuguese police officers, the Judicial Police, or the PJ. If, on his own testimony, he was in the McCann's apartment writing out the timelines for the PJ, how could he have been standing around in the tapas bar waiting for photographs to be printed one at a time at 90 second intervals. To sum up then, the entire story about Russell O'Brien using Amy Tierney's printer to print off these so-called first photos falls apart. This question must be asked. Was this first photo of Madeline prepared much earlier, maybe before the events of that evening, maybe even on the previous day? The evidence suggests that the McCanns may have got these first photo prints done elsewhere and have not told us where and when and how they did this. Perhaps it's yet another deceit in a catalogue of deceptions. Now it's time to take a detailed look at some strange goings on concerning the cameras of the McCanns and the pins and the whole way these photos or some of them were made public. These are the bare facts about the last photo. 1. The photograph was certainly taken that week. 2. It shows Jerry McCann, one of the twins, Amelie and Madeline, sitting by the pool. 3. It is sunny at the moment it was taken. 4. The shadows are very short. The sun is at its highest in Portugal at about 1.35pm that time of year, so it must have been taken around that time of day. 5. Jerry looks lightly tanned in this photo. 6. Yet in photos of him taken at the end of the week, after Madeline had been reported missing, he looks to be significantly more tanned. 7. Despite many weird and wonderful claims that this photo has been photoshopped, two world experts in photography and photoshopping, after extensive forensic analysis, have pronounced this photograph to be a genuine photograph with no photoshopping. The two experts were asked by a Madeleine McCann researcher to give their opinions on condition of anonymity. He has shown me their reports. The researcher put to the two experts a range of amateur opinions that the photo may have been photoshopped this, that or the other way, including claims that one or other of the three individuals in the shot had been photoshopped into the photo to create a composite picture. Eight. One expert is a highly respected university professor of photography. The other is the owner of a major digital photography business. One of their main lines of evidence is that all shadows on the photograph are consistent with each other and with the position of the sun at that time, high in the sky in the south. And such 100% consistency of shadows is almost impossible to fake. So just to make it clear that we are talking about a genuine photograph here, not a photoshopped one. Here is the professor's opinion. Quote, I have taken an initial look at the image. The artifacts alluded to in the PDF document that you sent are simply JPEG compression artifacts as described here. If you magnify other parts of the image, you will see similar artifacts. I also performed a forensic analysis to determine if the lighting and the shadows on the people and background are consistent. They are. I see no other anomalies in the photo. So, at first glance, I see no evidence of photo tampering. But then the professor adds something very important. I will add that it is fairly easy to change dates on an image's metadata or for these dates to be wrong. The owner of the major digital photography business held the same view. From what I saw, I couldn't see anything that would lead me to believe beyond reasonable doubt it had been doctored. The fringing mentioned can be caused by auto-sharpening used in consumer digital cameras to make better or sharper images. These artifacts can often be made worse from image compression algorithms out of Photoshop or other image manipulation software. According to the McCanns, the photo was taken at 2.29pm on the 3rd of May, hours before Madeline was reported missing. But could the date or time it was taken have been changed? The last photo made its first appearance in a coordinated set of releases to the press on Thursday the 24th of May, exactly three weeks after Madeline's reported disappearance. 
I am now going to explore what might have been happening to that photo, or rather the memory card on which it was located, during those three weeks. After that I will show you a raft of evidence that suggests this so-called last photo was actually taken on Sunday the 29th of April, the second day of the McCann's holiday, four days before the McCann's say it was taken. One of the most extraordinary aspects of the early part of the investigation into Madeleine's disappearance is that the Portuguese police never had access to the cameras of the McCanns and their Tapas 7 friends. With the benefit of hindsight, this was a significant error. But I suggest that we can excuse the Portuguese police for that. Since they were organising a massive search and being hounded by the frenzied international mainstream media in what they were led to believe by the McCanns was a hunt for an abducted child. Some journalists, especially British ones, were, in that very first week, vocalising bogus concerns that the Portuguese police were not pursuing the search for Madeleine vigorously enough. In fact, they drafted in hundreds of police officers to comb the area and local villagers spent days searching high and low for Madeleine. We now know from several sources that the McCanns and their advisers searched through their cameras and those of some of their friends, ending up by producing two CDs of photographs for police use. They did not hand their actual cameras or memory cards to the Portuguese police. It seems the police were too preoccupied searching for Madeleine, so there is no way of knowing for certain whether these CDs handed to the Portuguese police on Wednesday the 9th of May, or possibly the day before, were a true record of all of the images taken on that holiday by the McCanns and their friends. However, evidence suggests that the McCann team only gave carefully selected compilations of photographs to the police. I will suggest, as we examine the evidence, that it is probable that many photographs that could have been incriminating in one way or another were deleted before these CDs were given to the police. Who compiled the CDs of photographs handed to the Portuguese police? We know now that at least two people helped the McCanns extract images from their camera or memory cards to prepare them to be given to either the media or on CD to the police. One was a relative of Kate McCann, Michael Wright, from Skipton, Yorkshire. Still more significant, the other person helping the McCanns was the powerful figure of Alex Woolfall, who was described in the press as Mark Warner's expert in crisis management. But he was much more than that. He was actually the head of issues and crisis management for the entire Bell Pottinger group, the firm headed by public relations magnate Lord Bell, Lady Thatcher's former PR guru. Alex Wolfell's expertise appears to be more about rescuing the reputations of companies and individuals who are in a tight spot than in helping the search for an abducted child. His main expertise, like that of the McCann's chief PR spokesman, Clarence Mitchell, was in manipulating the media. Bell Pottinger is a company who seems to be prepared to represent anyone if the money is right. Lord Bell told author Owen Jones that the McCann's had paid his company half a million pounds to keep Madeleine on the front pages of British newspapers for a year. Lord Bell was quoted as saying, I'm not really interested in what the McCann's think. They paid me £500,000 in fees to keep them on the front page of every newspaper for one year, which we did. Now the first question we might ask is, why was it necessary for two people, let alone one, to help the McCann's prepare images for the police and the media, when the focus, after all, was on finding Madeleine? If the police really wanted photographs, why not just hand over their memory cards to the police? There is a Portuguese police statement dated Wednesday the 9th of May, six days after Madeleine was reported missing, confirming that Jerry McCann had handed into the Portuguese police at Portimao two CDs of photographs, one produced by him and one by his Yorkshire in-law, Michael Wright. Yet, on the very same day, a junior Hampshire police officer, Detective Constable Stuart William Martin, was examining two camera memory cards from an Olympus C50 camera, apparently containing valuable photographs from that week at Pride of Luz. 
A great mystery surrounds these two memory cards, which so far I have not been able to get to the bottom of. In fact, the police that day received these two memory cards and some video footage. These three exhibits were all labelled NALF, which are the initials of Hampshire resident Nigel Foster, who was on holiday with the McCanns that week in Pride de Luz. Nigel Foster was mentioned, though not by name, in Kate McCann's book, Madeline. Let's have a look at what she says about him. This incident is said to have taken place on the same day Madeline was reported missing. After my tennis lesson, I hung around the grassy play area, watching Jerry on the court and chatting to Russell O'Brien, who I'd found there. Another guest appeared with a video camera to record his three-year-old daughter playing mini tennis. He looked a little embarrassed and laughingly remarked to us that filming in this way made him feel like a dirty old man. It led to a conversation between the three of us about paedophiles. I remember Russell talking about how everything had got a bit out of hand, that these days people were so untrusting you hardly dared speak to children you didn't know. What he was effectively saying was that the world had become paranoid, that he wanted his daughters to grow up with confidence and a sense of freedom. The other dad, Nigel Foster, and I chipped in with our views. I mentioned not being allowed to take photographs of your own kids in swimming pools any longer. And we agreed that it was a shame things had come to this. It was just five days after this, Tuesday the 8th of May, that Nigel Foster took it upon himself to contact Leicestershire Police and offer his photographs from the holiday to the police. Things moved on rapidly. He was told to contact Hampshire Police. He did so, handing in not only his video footage from Pride of Luz, but also, apparently, two memory cards from an Olympus camera. From there, the police delivered these items to DC Martin's house that evening, and the following day DC Martin had these taken into his place of work, which was the Hampshire Police High-Tech Unit at Netley, Hampshire, one of the foremost high-tech units in the country. Here is his statement. Video tape from Sony Handycam video camera, 64 megabyte memory card from Olympus C50 camera, 32 megabyte memory card from Olympus C50 camera. The package contained an Olympus C50 camera and a memory card holder which contained one card in the camera and one card in the memory card holder. I imaged NALF Stroke 2 using guidance software, computer forensic software called NCASE version 5. I imaged NALF Stroke 3 using guidance software, computer forensic software called NCASE version 5. I located 43 pictures in the live area of the two cards. Using my forensic software, I was able to locate 73 picture files in the unallocated clusters which had been deleted and were no longer accessible to the camera user. I produced a report. I produced a compact disc, SWM301944, containing the pictures, and a report, SWM301945. I have also copied the pictures and the folders they appear on the cards to the disc. On the face of it, the Olympus camera and the two memory cards would appear to belong to Nigel Foster, along with the video footage. To give it its full description, it was an Olympus Camedia C50 5 megapixel digital camera, W stroke 3x optical zoom electronics. One reviewer pointed out one of its distinct advantages, writing, On the positive side, pictures are fantastic. I take this camera with me everywhere and barely have to make any adjustments for my picture taking. Also, the camera allows you to rotate the pictures and crop within the camera itself. It's great to have that capability before downloading to your computer. Such a time saver. But a great deal of speculation surrounds this camera and the two memory cards. For example, this black and white photograph shows the majority of the Tapa 7 group of friends enjoying tea time together at the Pareso Beach restaurant in Pride de Luz between 5.30pm and 6pm on the day Madeline was reported missing. A Madeline McCann researcher has been able to identify five of them. The person most likely to have taken this photo is Fiona Payne, husband of Dr David Payne, who is known to be a keen photographer and is not in the shot. The photograph closely matches an image captured on CCTV by the restaurant owner at exactly 10 minutes to 6 that afternoon. Photographs like this one could be very valuable from an evidential point of view. So what other photographs were taken on that camera that day or that week? 
As I'll show in a moment, we don't know what has become of all the other photos that were no doubt taken by Fiona and David Payne and by the other members of the Tapper 7 that week. So, why were the two sets of photographs being analysed by two separate police forces? Let me look in a bit more detail at what happened to the video footage on Nigel Foster's camera. On Tuesday the 8th of May, and remember this was only the fifth day after Madeline had been reported missing, Leicestershire Police, as this report shows, sent this email to their opposite number in Portugal. Would you kindly permit an officer to visit Mrs Foster? She has recently been on holiday to the Mark Warner complex and is in possession of video footage taken by her husband. It is understood that the footage is currently contained on their home computer. The allocated officer will need to review the footage and all footage of the complex should be downloaded onto a suitable storage disk. Mr Foster has indicated it probably only consists of a 30 second pan of the playground area stroke pool area stroke tapas bar. Mr and Mrs Foster are not technically competent to download the data. Please statement accordingly re-exhibit continuity. I have spoken to Mr Foster this morning and he has been advised that local officers will make contact with his wife. If possible please send a copy to me for initial viewing in the incident room. We see here that all that is mentioned is video footage lasting about 30 seconds. There is no mention however of a memory card, no mention of a second memory card and certainly no mention of a camera. So that still leaves the basic question unanswered. Who did these three items belong to? We find that on these two memory cards there were also 73 deleted photographs. Now there is nothing remarkable in that. We all delete some of our digital photographs from time to time. But what is strange is DC Martin does not mention having tried to retrieve any of these deleted images. You would have thought that in a case as important as this, a young missing child, that he would say something about recovering those images. These two memory cards were, after all, being examined at the Hampshire Police High Tech Unit in Netley. DC Martin says that he placed all the images on a disc. It appears he forwarded this disc to Leicestershire Police. One point I want to mention here, and I may develop in a later film, is the precise role of Leicestershire Police in this case. It came up in the Leveson inquiry where one of the witnesses was Matt Baggett, the Chief Constable of Leicestershire Constabulary at the time Madeline was reported missing. He was later promoted to run the police service of Northern Ireland. He made this remarkable disclosure to Leveson. On 8th of May 2007, Leicestershire Constabulary was asked to coordinate the UK response to assist the Portuguese inquiry on behalf of the UK Government and Association of Police Chief Officers. The gold strategy set on this date established that it was a Portuguese-led inquiry and that all actions comply with the requirements of Portuguese law, including their Judicial Secrecy Act. Due to the unprecedented media interest in the UK, a coordination group was set up on behalf of law enforcement agencies and government departments to coordinate the media interaction and ensure that a consistent stance was taken. This coordinating group was chaired by the Head of Corporate Communications from Leicestershire Constabulary. That group has continued to meet as required since 2007. Due to the thirst for information from the media, every individual working in Leicestershire supporting the police investigation signed a confidentiality agreement. Messages were also disseminated to all staff to make them aware that even private conversations with friends could be reported on in the media. The confidentiality agreement was something that was put together by the Gold Group who were running the inquiry as part of the UK effort, not by myself as Chief Constable. Bear in mind that if this Gold Group was established on Tuesday the 8th of May, someone at the highest possible level in the British government must have ordered this at least a day or two beforehand. At that time, Madeline might well have been found, dead or alive, at any time. What possible urgent need was there for such an intense, high-level strategy group? And isn't the excuse of unprecedented media interest rather a feeble one for setting up this high-powered group? A similar excuse 
the thirst for information from the media was also used to gag anyone connected with the inquiry who had to sign an unprecedented confidentiality agreement warning them that any breach of confidentiality would result in being prosecuted under the Official Secrets Act. One Madeleine McCann researcher put in an FOI request simply asking which agencies were represented on this high-level gold strategy group. The reply in October 2014 came back. Leicestershire Police can neither confirm nor deny that it holds the information you requested as the duty in Section 11A of the Act does not apply by virtue of the following exemptions. International Relations, Investigations, Law Enforcement. Section 27 recognises that the effective conduct of international relations depends on maintaining trust and confidence between governments. If the United Kingdom does not maintain this trust and confidence, its ability to protect and promote UK interests through international relations will be hampered, which will not be in the public interest. So, unable to even confirm or deny whether they even had information about which agencies were represented on that all-important strategy group, I would take an educated guess that government security agencies were well represented on that group. But to return to the matter of what happened to the disc of photographs that DC Martin compiled. In the Portuguese police files we find this short report from Inspector Ricardo Paiva. I can confirm that photographs from a CD provided by Leicestershire Police were visualised and analysed. These referred to photographs taken by the Foster's family during their holiday at the Ocean Club between the 28th of April and the 5th of May 2007. Upon analysing these photos, the result was that there was at least one photograph where some of the individuals making up the group of friends of the McCann's couple were visualised, nothing relevant being found for the investigation. So, after the effort of examining two memory cards, whosoever they really belonged to, and a short video clip of 30 seconds, all that they had was one photo with some of the Tapper 7 on it. But perhaps what is of more interest is what was happening to some other photographs down in Portugal. On the very same day that DC Martin was downloading digital photographs from two memory cards from the Olympus, Jerry McCann likewise was handing in two computer disks of photographs to the Portuguese police in Portimao. And these images, apparently 113 images and dozens of duplicates, we can see in the Portuguese police files and they are mostly, or all, from the holiday. The trouble is the Portuguese police were not handed any original memory cards. It appears just images scanned into PDF format and then put onto a couple of CDs. Nearly all of the images appear in the files as grainy, poor quality black and white images. Colour photographs taken by the Portuguese police which appear in the police files are reasonably clear, so why do the images provided on a CD by Jerry McCann look like this? A volunteer Portuguese translator known as Album has analysed these black and white images and made these introductory comments on them. He says there are 97 pages of images, mostly black and white silhouettes, many duplicates. Almost all of the black and white images do not readily permit identification of the individual. They were created for the PDF using what is known as black and white scanning and printing. Just three of the images were produced in both black and white and in colour, namely the three playground photographs that we have already seen. It seems odd that just these three pictures have been made available in colour. Why couldn't Jerry McCann have made them all available in colour? But the lack of colour is not the only problem in making use of these photographs. There is no information about which camera or cameras they came from. 
A Portuguese police officer, Ricardo Paiva, simply states the following. On this date, Tuesday the 9th of May, I state that the photographs contained on the two CDs delivered to this police force by Gerald McCann and Michael Wright have been visualised and analysed. Some of them are from the holiday period that the McCann family spent at the Ocean Club in Pride de Luz, beginning on the 28th of April 2007. The visualisation and analysis of these images that was carried out reveals that there are several photographs of interest to the investigation in which it is possible to visualise Madeleine McCann, nor are these photos accompanied by any details of the times they were taken or even the dates, information which certainly might be able to help in their detective work. Were Jerry McCann, Michael Wright and Alex Wolfell engaged in a deliberate operation to give the police as little information as possible, whilst at the same time appearing to be as helpful as possible? Elsewhere, Portuguese police inspector Hugo Ferreira states this. I am pleased to inform you that today we were given photographic stills taken during the holiday period in Portugal from the 28th of April by the English families that composed the group that Madeleine Beth McCann was with, so that they can be annexed to the process files. This statement makes the most sense. It is clear that the two CDs taken in by Jerry McCann and Michael Wright were a composite of photographs taken from maybe several cameras. Indeed, when we look through the photographs, we see many photographs obviously taken by the panes of themselves and their apartment. Others may have come from the Oldfields, or from Jane Tanner, or Dr. Russell O'Brien, or indeed from the McCann's camera. There is still some doubt about whether the McCann's camera was the Canon or the Olympus examined in Hampshire, or both. But as I shall show in a moment, we do know, at least, that the famous last photo was definitely taken on the Canon, shown clearly on the table in the lounge of the McCann's apartment when the Portuguese police took their first photograph of the scene. One issue that becomes clear as we examine these black and white photos is that some of the photos appear to have been tampered with before being put on the computer disks. Take this one, for example, which is a cropped duplicate of another photo. In other words, someone, presumably either Jerry McCann, Alex Wolfel or Michael Wright, has cropped the photo, taking bits out of it, before handing it to the Portuguese police. In addition, there is no black and white version of a cropped playground photograph of Madeleine and Lily together, the one from which we get this picture. This is all that we get in the files, a cropped black and white image side by side with a cropped colour image. So the cropping must have been done on a computer. Something that we saw earlier can be done on the Olympus camera that was handed into the police in Hampshire, apparently by the Fosters. It tends to suggest that those who compiled these images for the Portuguese police just scanned three of them in colour, the three playground pictures, those being the ones they wanted the police to see, whilst scanning the remainder in black and white because they didn't want the police nor the public to be able to have a clear look at those photos. This tells us one simple thing, that these images did not all come straight out of a camera memory card onto a computer disk. Some of them at least have been tampered with or manipulated in one way or another before being given to the Portuguese police. And is it possible Jerry McCann, Alex Wolfel and Michael Wright made sure that any inconvenient and embarrassing photographs were never put on those two computer disks in the first place? The Portuguese police received the two disks of photographs on the 9th of May. The very next day, both the McCanns were in the police station answering questions. Kate McCann had her camera presumably the Canon with her, in the actual police station, and was looking at the photographs and making notes on them. Were the Portuguese police duped into thinking that they had got all the relevant photographs from that camera on those two discs the day before? Michael Wright was aged 44 on the day Madeleine was reported missing. He had married Anne-Marie, a cousin of Dr. Kate McCann. He was military trained and was said at the time to have been a partner in an IT company. Michael Wright and his wife and the McCanns used to meet up from time to time, mostly at family events, once in 2006 and once in February 2007. Their families were close and they stayed in each other's houses. 
The first Christmas after Madeline was reported missing, the two families spent Christmas together. At a hearing in the long-running McCann v. Amaral libel trial in September 2013, Michael Wright admitted to extensive monitoring of Madeleine McCann discussion forums on the internet. In the court, he referred to extensive notes he had made in green ink to prepare for giving his evidence. The judge in the hearing saw these notes and asked him about them. He said he had written them up the night before in his hotel room. In a written statement to the Portuguese police, Wright said that he caught the plane from Leeds Bradford Airport to Faro on Saturday the 5th of May, initially staying in an apartment in the same complex as the McCanns. He says he returned six days later on Friday the 11th of May for a weekend with my family. It seems that one of his main tasks whilst he was in Portugal for those six days was to select and maybe manipulate a series of photos in order to produce a computer disk for the Portuguese police on the 9th of May. Meanwhile, the head of public relations at Bell Pottinger, one of the world's biggest PR companies, Alex Wolfall, was working on another similar or parallel project. He was also helping Jerry McCann with photographs in his camera as this report in the Times on the 6th of October 2007 informs us. The McCanns had photographs of Madeline on their digital camera, which Mr. Wolfall began transferring to a laptop computer. I said to Kate, let's try to identify pictures where her face is visible. Downloading the images was a very difficult process for them. It was upsetting. Mr. Wolfall transmitted the photographs to the Press Association in London, from where they were distributed to the media. The portfolio included the now famous image of Madeline wearing a hat on a tennis court. That's the so-called tennis balls photo, by the way. So that article in the Times made things very clear. PR man Alex Wolfall had access to Jerry McCann's camera and memory card and was transferring the photos onto a laptop computer. And of course, if he was transferring them, he could at the same time have been deleting, amending or cropping some of them. So, exactly when was Alex Wolfall transferring these photographs from the McCann's camera to the computer? He maintained that he flew there on Saturday the 5th of May, but in fact the flight records show that he travelled there on Friday the 4th of May, the very day after Madeline was reported missing. Why did he have to be there the very next day? A senior member of one of the world's most prestigious PR companies. Madeline could even have been found during this flight to Portugal. Why did he rush over there? What was his mission exactly? Why did the top man have to go? Why couldn't one of the more junior staff fly out there? And how exactly could any public relations officer search for Madeline? The Times article told us he was transmitting photographs to the Press Association. And we now know that one of the first photographs he transmitted on Saturday the 5th of May, according to the data, was the controversial tennis balls photo that we looked at earlier. It seems clear also that Wolfall was behind the sending of this photo to the Press Association on Friday the 4th of May as well. That was certainly quick work if he had only just arrived there that day. And it was this very iconic photograph of Madeline that appeared on the front cover of Kate McCann's book, Madeline four years later. It would mean that Wolfall was not only in Praia de Luz on the day after Madeline was reported missing, but before the day was out he had met the McCanns, got their camera, and was already sending images from that camera to the Daily Mirror that day. Madeline in the red dress, and to the press association the next day, the tennis balls photo. But here's a strange fact that was picked up by a sharp-eyed poster on the complete mystery of Madeleine McCann forum. No one else seems to have picked it up. Here's a new report that appeared in the magazine PR Week, the public relations rag for the public relations officers. This article appeared on the 9th of May issue of PR Week. The head of risk and crisis management of one of the world's biggest PR firms, Alex Wolfall, had been dispatched to Portugal, so this was clearly a significant news item for the journal. But look at the two lines underlined in red. Mark Warner brought in Resonate on a generic brief a week before three-year-old Madeline was kidnapped. 
Now this is very odd. Resonate is simply a subsidiary of Bell Pottinger. There is no explanation at all of why they were sent the week before. What public relations need did Mark Warner have in Praia de Luz the week before Madeleine and her family were there? None that I am aware of or can even think of. And then at the end of the PR Week report we read this. After Madeleine was kidnapped, managing director Michael Froelich referred the firm to his parent company's crisis specialist Alex Wolfall. Froelich and resonant director Tricia Moon are helping liaise with the British consul in Portugal, the Portuguese police and the Portuguese and UK media. This seems like an astonishing coincidence. Handily available to the powers that be at the very moment Madeleine was allegedly kidnapped were no less than Michael Froelich and Tricia Moon, the managing director and director respectively of Resonate, a subsidiary of probably the UK's number one public relations firm. And already Resonate was liaising with the British consul. It was the British ambassador and consular staff who dramatically and successfully intervened when the Portuguese police, two days after Madeleine's reported disappearance, wanted to seize some of the McCann's clothing. After this intervention, the McCann's washed their clothes, thus preventing the police from subjecting them to forensic analysis. I am going to suggest that there is evidence pointing to Madeleine having died on the Sunday that week. Is it possible that the bosses of Bell Pottinger sent the managing director and director of their subsidiary company Resonate on ahead, as it were, to make some initial inquiries and undertake an early assessment of the situation in advance of their big guns jetting to pride of us on the day after Madeleine was reported missing? I want now to look at the very important subject of why it took a whole three weeks to publish the evocative last photo of Madeleine. It was on Thursday the 10th of May, a week having gone by since Madeleine was reported missing, that both Jerry and Kate McCann found themselves in Portimao Police Station to face a series of difficult questions. On that occasion, Jerry was detained for 13 hours. His friend, Dr. Matthew Oldfield, was also interviewed that day, and obviously put under great pressure by the police. He was described as almost hysterical in the interview. Jerry McCann heard him shouting and crying. Perhaps he was struggling to explain all the absurdities surrounding his insistence that he really did check on the children at about 9.30pm, the night Madeline was reported missing. That day, the 10th of May, Kate sat in the waiting area for eight hours before being told that it was too late for her to be interviewed that day. But she also told us this, I made use of the long wait I anticipated by sitting down with a notebook, pen and my camera containing the dated photographs of the holiday and trying to write a detailed account of everything that had happened the week before. So here she gives a clear indication that so she says all her images had a date stamp imprinted on them. She makes sure the word dated is in there. Meanwhile, Jerry McCann, during his police interviews, said apart from those two discs that he and Michael Wright had handed in the day before, he had no others in his possession. A number of these pictures featured the Payne's children, so the McCanns must have used a number of photos from the Payne's camera. It's probably reasonable to assume that the three playground photographs we saw before were taken by the McCanns, and as we saw earlier, we can say with near certainty that all three were taken on day one of the holiday, the Saturday. But if that's the case, where are all the other photographs that the McCanns took that week? It was a Canon camera a Canon PowerShot A620 that was left in the middle of the table in the living room of the McCann's apartment. And we must assume that when she was holding a camera while Jerry McCann was being interviewed by the police in Porty Mao on the 10th of May, that was also her Canon camera. It almost looks like a prop. There are very few objects visible in the photograph, and so the camera seems to stand out almost ostentatiously, as if to say, look, our camera, nothing to see here. 
But as we have seen, there is evidence from the black and white photos on the two CDs handed in by Jerry McCann that the images have been tampered with, with deletions of many of them, and cropping of some others. And let's suppose, as I shall be suggesting later, that something serious happened to Madeline much earlier in the week, it would be perfectly possible for the McCanns, or someone they knew, to have removed the memory cards, deleted inconvenient photographs, cropped them, or perhaps even removed them altogether, and substituted a new memory card, done all of this before they claimed later in the week that Madeline had been abducted. They could also have stored the images on a computer disk for later amendments to be made by them. If so, there would be nothing incriminating for the police to find in their camera. It seems that the Portuguese police never seized the camera. There is no mention of their doing so in the files, and they therefore let the McCanns take it away with them as they moved that night after reporting Madeline missing to stay in the Payne's flat. We can hardly blame the Portuguese police for this unfortunate omission. For a week, the McCanns had been insisting that Madeleine had been abducted, aided and abetted by a mighty public relations and media onslaught. These three individuals, Jerry McCann, Alex Wolfall and Michael Wright, examined various memory cards for the dual purpose of A. producing two CD discs for the Portuguese police, and b. producing images for the mass media. Some of those images had been cropped before they got to the Portuguese police, showing that they had already been digitally altered. All of this demonstrates, without a shadow of a doubt, the potential for manipulation of the memory cards before they were sent to Hampshire police and before Jerry McCann and Michael Wright handed in their carefully selected photos on those two CDs. Inconvenient photographs could easily have been deleted, cropped, or even photoshopped, so as to attempt to confirm the McCann's account of events that week. And what do we make of this part of Jerry's statement on the 10th of May, when Kate was also in the police station, Canon camera in her hand? The witness fully confirms the statements made previously at this police department on the 4th of May 2007, being available to provide any further clarifications. Asked, he clarifies that, apart from the personal photographs already delivered by him to the police authorities after the disappearance of his daughter Madeline, he has no others in his possession. He adds that it is his wife, Kate, who usually takes pictures. He does not recall taking any pictures during this holiday at night. This is an outright lie. The photographs on the CDs handed to the police did not include the last photo. But Jerry and Kate still had possession of the last photo taken on the Canon because it was published two weeks later on the 24th of May. He told the police a barefaced lie. So this brings me back to the subject of the last photo and whether or not it was taken at 2.29pm on Thursday the 3rd of May, the afternoon of the day Madeline was reported missing. It appears to be a genuine photograph taken by Kate McCann on the McCann's Canon camera. This is what Kate McCann says about the last photo in her book. Some images are etched for all time on my brain. Madeline, that lunchtime, Thursday the 3rd of May, is one of them. She was wearing an outfit I'd bought especially for her holiday, a peach-coloured smock top from Gap, and some white broad re-anglaise shorts from Monsoon, a small extravagance perhaps, but I'd pictured how lovely she would look in them, and I'd be right. She was striding ahead of Fiona and me, swinging her bare arms to and fro. The weather was a little on the cool side, and I remember thinking I should have brought a cardigan for her although she seemed oblivious of the trauma, just happy and carefree. I was following her with my eyes, admiring her. I wonder now, the nausea rising in my throat, if someone else was doing the same. We've already noted that on the last photo, Jerry does not look as suntanned as he does by the end of the week. That is one indication that the photo might not have been taken on the Thursday as claimed. Are there any others? Let's look first of all at the way Madeline is dressed. The most obvious feature is her pretty pink one-piece dress. As one observer remarked, it looks like she is in her Sunday best. 
What was Madeleine allegedly doing that Thursday morning? It is claimed that on Thursday morning she had been sailing with other members of her group. It seems unlikely that she went to the crash that morning dressed in the pretty pink dress if she was going to go sailing. If she did not, then in order for her to be photographed in the dress at 2.29pm, the McCanns must have gone back to their apartment and changed her for the afternoon into that dress. But let's move on to a much more significant area of concern, namely the weather on the day that photograph was taken. If we look at the photograph, we see very short shadows. The sun was at its highest that time of year, around 1.35pm. The photograph was probably taken within one hour of that time. The last photo is said to have been taken at 2.29pm. So the shadows, at least, are consistent with what the McCanns say about this photograph. The shadows show us that it was a sunny day at the moment the photo was taken. Let us also consider these six points. 1. Jerry McCann is dressed in a t-shirt and shorts. 2. He is wearing sunglasses. 3. There is a sheen of perspiration visible on his forehead. 4. The children are both wearing sun hats. 5. Jerry McCann's feet are in the pool, which Kate described in her book is very cold. 6. There is no obvious sign of any cooling breeze in the picture. Some might say this picture could have been taken in a few moments of sun on an otherwise cloudy day. But with Jerry coming out to the pool with his sunglasses on, in his shorts, and with perspiration on his brow, it is surely likely that this was a very warm day with plenty of sunshine. So how does the weather at the beginning of the McCann's holiday week compare with the weather on Thursday, the day Madeline was reported missing? Let's have a close look. Here we have a chart showing the weather records for Pride de Luz on the Thursday. We can also see the same weather pattern for the week as a whole if we look at this weather chart. If we look at the top of the chart, we see the temperatures up to 21 degrees C, that's 70 degrees Fahrenheit, on the Saturday and Sunday. Then they fall away for the rest of the week, until once again the temperatures slowly begin to rise again at the end of the week. If we now look at the bottom of the chart, we see that on Saturday and Sunday there is no cloud cover at all, whilst from Monday onwards we see a great deal of cloud. They show that in the Thursday there was about 50% cloud cover from dawn, rising to nearly 100% cloud cover by the early afternoon. The temperature chart shows us that the temperature on Thursday rose from a cool 13 degrees C, 55 Fahrenheit in the morning, to just 17 degrees C, 63 Fahrenheit around midday, when the photo was supposed to have been taken, and then to 19 degrees C, 66 Fahrenheit in the afternoon. This then does not look like a day which is so warm that it causes a man to dress only in a t-shirt and shorts, dipping his feet into a cold pool, to have sweat on his brow. Not only that, but as we saw just now, Kate McCann confirms this with her own words in her book. The weather was a little on the cool side, and I remember thinking I should have brought a cardigan for her. But again, this photograph hardly gives the impression of being a little on the cool side sunglasses, people in short sleeves and shorts, sun hats and sweaty brow, dipping their feet in a cold pool. In fact, the only two days on that holiday that were hot and sunny were the Saturday and Sunday. If we have a look at the weather chart for Sunday the 29th of April, we see that the maximum temperature after midday reaches 21 degrees C or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, certainly warmer than Thursday. And we also see that the day is sunny throughout, much more like sunglasses and shorts weather. One well-respected Madeleine McCann researcher, a retired former police superintendent, has collected dated photographs to show exactly how the weather changed on the Monday of that week. Here are three photographs taken from almost the same place on Saturday, Sunday and Monday respectively. Here is another picture taken on Sunday at nearby Lagos, a beautiful, clear, sunny day, just as the weather on the last photograph also appears to be. 
The following three pictures, taken on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, continue to show the cooler, cloudier weather persisting through the week. The change from the sunny weather of Saturday and Sunday to the cloudier, cooler, wetter airstream which reached the Algarve during the Monday is clear. Compared with the photographs we saw earlier from Sunday, the photos from Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday all show a much greater amount of cloud cover and evidence of a cooling wind. An ex-RAF man, now an ex-Pat living in Pride de Luz, kept daily weather records. His diary confirms the cloudier, windy, cooler conditions that prevailed on that Thursday when the last photo was supposed to have been taken. As most of you watching this film will be aware, there are hundreds, indeed thousands of people who discuss the disappearance of Madeleine McCann in depth on various websites, forums and blogs. Some of these people are experts in their field, and I'm going to now quote from one of them, a retired former police superintendent who has studied the case in depth and even written an e-book on the case, available on Kindle. This is part of his professional opinion on the last photo. On the first full day of a family holiday, children and adults are dressed in their new holiday clothes. Everyone goes out to explore the resort. They look at the pool, find the supermarket and generally get their bearings. And above all, if it is a fine sunny day, they take photos of the area, of the pool, of new and unaccustomed flowers and plants, cactuses, bougainvillea, and they take lots of photographs of their children, because you never know when it might turn cloudy or rain. Add this known behaviour to the weather reports and consider these existing photographs, and then add the relative ease with which the date can be altered on a digital image, and we may surely be forgiven for beginning to suspect that the last photo is not as it is being presented. Both Saturday and Sunday, the only two warm and sunny days that week, seem the probable days on which the last photo was taken, but the McCanns and their friends did not arrive in Pryor de Luz until 3pm on the Saturday, which rules out that day. We are forced by the available evidence to deduce that the last photograph was probably taken at lunchtime on Sunday the 29th of April. Moreover, the retired former police officer goes on to make these very valid points. Again, I quote, If and only if this is correct, it gives rise to some serious concerns. The last photo may be a forgery. In English law, a forgery is any document that tells a lie about itself. It purports to be something it is not. In this case, a photo taken on Thursday the 3rd of May, the day Madeleine was reported missing. If the EXIF metadata showing the time and date had been altered, then a serious offence has been committed of attempting to pervert the course of justice. The person who altered the time and date would be involved. Any person who says it was taken on that date would also be involved. Any person who handled the photograph, the camera or the memory chip might be involved. The person who knowingly put this photograph into the public domain would very clearly be involved and jointly they might all be guilty of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. So the question to be asked is clear. Where was Madeleine at lunchtime on the 3rd of May 2007? I have examined the last photo, the one on the McCann Files website, myself. McCann Files is the best known and best used internet library on the case. I discovered that the internet file on the McCann Files website has been modified with a computer package called Adobe Lightroom. Lightroom is certainly capable of changing the metadata, but this doesn't prove much 
it may have been loaded into Adobe Lightroom and saved before it was received by McCann Files. What I can say, however, is that changing the date on a digital camera image file can certainly be done easily in the hands of someone familiar with digital camera technology. If someone wanted to alter the metadata on some of the photographs on their camera, they would normally have to go to someone familiar with how to do it, a camera expert. So, how and when was the last photo released to the general public? This appears to be the sequence of events. Thursday the 3rd of May, date Madeline was reported missing. The last photo was presumably on the Canon memory card. McCann's decide to issue photo of Madeline taken about a year ago. Several other photos are released to the media in the next few days. Sunday the 20th of May, Jerry McCann flies to England. During his visit, he was obliged to obtain any item from his house with Madeline's DNA on it. He found a pillow and Leicestershire police took a swab of DNA from it. Monday the 21st of May, meetings in London. On the Monday, he had extensive meetings with top British police officers and with Jim Gamble, the head of the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre. Those meetings are not really the subject of this film, but they are a topic I hope to return to in the future. Tuesday the 22nd of May. Jerry McCann says he met Tony Blair's chief media spinner, Clarence Mitchell, the head of the media monitoring unit at the Central Office of Information for the first time. Later that day, they travelled to Portugal together. Also on Tuesday the 22nd of May, on the very same day, Jerry McCann's sister, Philomena McCann, also flew to Portugal to join the McCanns there. She had left her home in Ullapool, Scotland, and flown from Glasgow Airport to Portugal to join her brother, Jerry McCann. Now that might be significant, because her husband, Tony Rickwood, is a camera expert and highly experienced photographer and photoshopper. His photoshopping work came to light on the Deviant Art website, which hosts all kinds of unusual and deviant digital art and photography. In Rickwood's case, some of his pictures were produced as a result of his fetish for what is called quicksand fetish art, that is, photoshopped pictures of women, sometimes naked, drowning in water, mud or quicksand. I pose this question. Whilst Jerry McCann was back in England from the Sunday to Tuesday that week, could he have met with or communicated with his sister, Philomena McCann, and her photoshopping husband, Tony Rickwood, given him the memory card from the Canon camera, or sent them a copy of the original file, and asked him to simply alter the date the last photo was taken. Thursday the 24th of May. The last photo was released to the public via the Press Association. The last photo, however, was not amongst the mainly black and white photos on the two discs handed to the Portuguese police by Jerry McCann and Michael Wright. Why ever not? Why did they mislead the Portuguese police by not showing them this photograph? Why was it not used to produce those very first pictures of Madeline that were released? And why did it take three weeks to release it? Why was it only released barely 24 hours after both Jerry McCann and his sister with the photoshopping husband arrived by plane in Portugal late on Tuesday evening, the 22nd of May. And so, finally, I ask, is 2.29pm on Thursday the 3rd of May, the date Madeline was reported missing, the true time that photograph was taken or not? So, having examined a variety of evidence, including the high possibility that the last photo was taken on Sunday, and it seems to me there are no confirmed photos of Madeline being alive after Sunday, what other evidence do we have, if any, that Madeline was alive for the rest of the week? The evidence can be summed up as follows. 1. The evidence of the McCanns. 2. The evidence of their Tapas seven friends. 3. The evidence of third parties, such as staff of the Ocean Club and other guests there that week. 4. The evidence of Mrs. Pamela Fenn, a lady who lived in a flat above the McCanns, who said she heard crying between 10.30pm and 11.45pm on Tuesday the 1st of May. And 5. 
the creche records, which purport to show that Madeleine attended the creche every day that week. On the face of it, even though some of the other evidence that she was alive after Sunday that we have looked at has not stood up to scrutiny, this appears to be an impressive list of evidence. But let's examine just how impressive it is. I'm going to focus, first of all, on the evidence of third parties that week. Then I'm going to look at some interesting aspects of the McCann's conduct that week. I'll start by examining in detail the third party most closely involved with Madeline that week, and that's the creche nanny Catriona Baker, or Cat Baker, the nanny in charge of the creche which included Madeline, called the Lobster Group. This group met in a small room on the first floor of the main Ocean Club reception. It was for a small group of children aged between three and five. Their names were Jessica B, Alexander M, Madeline McCann, Elizabeth N, Ella O'Brien, daughter of Russell O'Brien and Jane Tanner, Tia P and William T. So just seven children, two of whom highlighted were Madeline and Ella, the daughter of Jane Tanner and Russell O'Brien. Creche nannies are usually hired from many countries for the season. In Cat Baker's case, in one statement, she says she had many years' experience, and in another, just that she'd been employed by Mark Warner at the Ocean Club in the 2006 season. She was engaged again in 2007 from Saturday the 21st of April, just one week before the McCanns and their group of friends arrived. It seems she made a simple mistake earlier by saying she was contracted from the 21st of March. She was only 20 years old in 2007 and had apparently studied at an English university for a period. In her book, Kate McCann describes how she was introduced to Cat Baker the first afternoon they arrived. Kate says, I warmed to her straight away. To enrol, parents take their children to the creche. Details are recorded, name of child, parent's name, contact telephone number, any health concerns such as asthma or allergies, etc. The child is then given an identity bracelet and placed in a specific group with a specific nanny. The maximum size of any group is seven. Which any nanny receives a child on day one remains the child's nanny for the rest of the week. There are two three-hour creche sessions from 9.30 till 12.30 and 2.30 till 5.30. The nanny who is responsible for the child is also responsible for the register. Mark Warner stipulates that parents must sign the children in and out of the creche, giving the time of day they have done so. Madeline was in Cat Baker's Lobster's Group, so the lobster crash records were obtained by the police after Madeline was reported missing. This is what they look like. If we take these records at face value, then they tell us that Madeline was in the crash for the following periods. Sunday morning, 9.45 till 12.15, afternoon, 2.45 till 5.30, total of five and a quarter hours. Monday morning, 9.30 till 12.10, afternoon, 3.15 to 3.30, total of 2 hours and 55 minutes. Tuesday morning, 9.30 to 12.20. Afternoon, Madeline was left at the creche at 2.30 p.m., no time of collection shown. Wednesday morning, 9.20 till 12.30. Afternoon, 2.45 to 5.30, total 4 hours and 55 minutes. Thursday morning, 9.10 to 12.25. Afternoon, 2.50 to 5.30, total 4 hours and 55 minutes. Let's now have a closer look at Cat Baker. On the 14th of October 2007, just five weeks after the McCanns had been declared suspects and the McCann team's PR efforts were at their most intense, the Mail on Sunday ran a story headed Revealed, the nanny who could help clear the McCann's name. The article told us, for five months, the identity of the Mark Warner employee who was looking after Madeline in Pride of Luz's Kids Club in the hours before her disappearance has been a closely held secret. On the morning after Madeline's disappearance, it is believed she even told Portuguese police of a man she had seen acting suspiciously around the apartments. Today we can reveal her identity as 20-year-old Catriona Baker, the daughter of a nurse and draftsman from Manchester. Miss Baker has told friends she is convinced of the McCann's innocence. She is still in contact with Kate McCann. Intriguingly, Miss Baker revealed to one friend, spoken to by this newspaper, that she told Portuguese police of a man she saw acting strangely near the apartment in the days leading up to Madeline's disappearance on the 3rd of May. 
She was interviewed for just three hours by the police on the morning of Madeline's disappearance. The Mail on Sunday has also learned that within 24 hours of that interview, Ms Baker was dispatched by Mark Warner to take up a new post in the Greek resort of San Agostino, along with four other members of staff. They were all linked to the seven holidaymakers who had eaten in the resort's tapas restaurant with Kate and Jerry on the night of Madeline's disappearance. On the day Madeline disappeared, Miss Baker had spent nearly six hours with the toddler. In the afternoon, the McCanns played tennis while Madeline went back to her nanny at the children's club, who gave her tea at 5.30pm. Madeline, Sean and Emily were picked up by their parents at 6pm. The Mail on Sunday article states as a fact that the McCanns played tennis while Madeline went back to her nanny at the children's club, who gave her tea at 5.30pm. Madeline, Sean and Emily were picked up by their parents at 6pm. But earlier I explained that there were so many contradictions about the claim that Madeline and the twins and their parents were having high tea together that we could not rely on those accounts as proving that Madeline was alive at that time. And Kate's later story was not that she was playing tennis, but that she went for a long run along the beach. Let's also observe that in this statement, in the Mail on Sunday, it sweeps aside all the McCann's evidence, contradictory though it was, about picking up the children at 5.25pm and 5.30pm. We saw how Kate claimed that Jerry had got there before Kate, and that she had come to the high tea straight from her long jog along the beach, etc., etc. The Cat Baker article contradicts all of that by simply saying, the parents, plural, picked her up at 6 p.m. Another interesting feature of the Mail article is the claim that Cat Baker saw a man acting suspiciously. The Mail article tells us that Cat Baker had spoken to a friend who then spoke to the Mail on Sunday. According to the Mail, she was said to have told the Portuguese police of a man acting strangely near the apartments in the days leading up to Madeline's disappearance. This is, of course, classic hearsay evidence. Spoke to a friend. Spoke to a newspaper. But now let's look at what she actually told the Portuguese police at the time when she made a statement to them on Sunday the 6th of May, just days after Madeline's reported disappearance. We might bear in mind here that what she says was translated into Portuguese by the controversial Robert Murat, acting as an English-Portuguese translator. Here is her statement. Questioned, she responds that since she has been working with the little girl, it has seemed to her that the parents were attentive to their daughter, given that they asked what Madeline had done in the creche, and that they even accompanied Madeline a few times in certain outside activities. Concerning the little girl, she states that she was an active and sociable child. Only on the first day was she more reticent within the group. The informant reports that during the time that Madeline was entrusted to her care, at no time did it seem to her that the little girl was sad or unhappy, and she never made any comment about being cross, sad or discontent about anything. She also reports that she was an obedient child who never wandered from the group and who never spoke to strangers. When asked, the informant responds that it was always the parents who brought Madeline and fetched her from the mini-club. Let's just note what she says in this paragraph about whether she saw anyone suspicious. When questioned, she responds that in the course of her work on the company's premises and outside, as described above, she has never noticed anyone in particular or suspicious watching the children with whom she was working. She did not notice anyone taking photos of the children, and notably of Madeline. She states that she never heard her colleagues refer to such things either. One thing we notice in her statement is that she says nothing at all about what activities she and her group were doing that week. There's no detail whatsoever about what Madeline was doing. She doesn't mention any specific incidents about her at all. But she is quite clear in this initial statement about these three things. She never noticed anyone in particular or suspicious watching the children. She didn't notice anyone taking photos of any of the children. And she never heard her colleagues refer to such things either. So here we have an absolute contradiction. Less than 72 hours after Madeline is reported missing, she is quite clear that 
she never noticed anyone suspicious. Yet five months later, we find out from the Mail on Sunday that she is a friend of the McCann's, has spoken to them, that the McCann's have invited her to visit their home, and that she has now spoken to a friend who has spoken to the newspaper. Now the Mail on Sunday suddenly claims that she saw a man acting suspiciously in the days leading up to Madeline's disappearance. Cat Baker still seems to be on close terms with the McCann's today. There was even one indication that she may have been known to the McCann's before 2007. As soon as Cat Baker's name was made public, Madeline McCann researchers looked her up on the internet. It was established that Cat Baker had been back in 2006, before Madeline disappeared in 2007, a Facebook friend of Chloe Corner, the daughter of John Corner, who is Madeline's godfather. John Corner later stated that he had been a frequent visitor to Pride de Luz. Today Cat Baker has a different surname and remains friends with Chloe Corner. So already we have two reasons for not trusting Cat Baker as a witness of truth. Moreover, we have a third possible contradiction regarding Cat Baker's claim that Madeline went sailing on the morning of Thursday the 3rd of May, the day Madeline was reported missing. This comes about from Cat Baker's third statement in the case, this time to Leicestershire Police, on the 18th of April 2008. Here it is. I got to know Jerry and Kate McCann on the Sunday morning, 29th of the 4th, 2007, in the Minis Club. They brought the children, and as it was their first day of holidays, the normal procedure was that they were allocated a childcare worker. I visited the family in their home, at their invitation, to see how they were getting along in November 2007. On Thursday the 3rd of May 2007, I remember Jerry having accompanied Madeline to the club between 9.15 and 9.20 that morning. I do not remember who came to pick her up for lunch, but after, she returned in the afternoon for a dive stroke swim. On this day I remember that we sailed and I saw friends of the McCann's on the beach. Around 14.45, Madeline returned to the minis club on top of the reception, but I do not remember who accompanied her. This afternoon we went swimming. Kate went to get Madeline from the tapas bar area, and according to what I remember, she was wearing sporting clothes, and I assumed she was participating in some form of athletics. It was around 15.25 to 18.00. I think that Jerry was playing tennis. There was one occasion on Thursday the 3rd of May 2007, around 10.30 in the morning, where she cried at the launch of the yellow safety boat in the ocean where all the children were sailing. She was scared and fearful and cried on my lap, I am scared, I am scared. We only used the launchers to transport the children to the small yellow boats. When we returned to the other boat she was happy again. She sailed in the small boat, and even though some children had the opportunity to return to the port, she stayed for a second time in the small boat, as she appeared to be having a good time. Looking in more detail at her statement, she told the police that during the first two days, Sunday the 29th and Monday the 30th of April, the children played and did activities in the sand. On Thursday, she says, they sailed to the next beach in the morning in a small yellow catamaran. On the 10th of May, seven days after Madeline was reported missing, Inspector Pino and a colleague asked Cat Baker to accompany them on a reconstruction of what supposedly happened that previous Thursday morning. It is possible they already had suspicion that Madeline was not present or that the events as reported were untrue. Here's part of his statement. Today, 10th of May 2007, Accompanied by Geo Barreras and Catriona Baker, the nanny responsible for the missing minor, we retraced the places and times at which they left the resort to go to Pride de Luz. We were told by Catriona that they went to the beach on Thursday between 10 and 11 o'clock. And 1. The parents left the children at Baby Club, Mark Warner, situated next to the principal reception and which is open 24 hours. 2. Then Catriona with Madeline and four or five more children walked toward the beach about 100 metres. 3. She was always in front with the children behind, linked together in a snake. 4. They crossed Rua de Rita, turned right towards Pico do Nordeste to the bottom of the steps at Travesa das Redes. 5. After reaching the beach, they went along a boardwalk to an area where there was a red awning and several thatched sunshades. 6. On that day, they sailed in a small yellow catamaran. 
But Inspector Pino's report also noted this, that Alice Stanley accompanied the children on the route and on the boat. Three children sailed with her. Chris Unsworth transported the children in a red amphibious boat, a life-saving boat, until the boat reached the open area and, a few minutes later, returned them to the beach to pick up three other children from the group. Both state that the children did not have any contact with anyone else during the time they were at the beach, as was the case during their walk to the beach. They both add that they did not see anyone suspicious looking at the children or in the surrounding areas. So both these witnesses, according to Inspector Pino, do not mention that Cat Baker went sailing with Madeline's group that morning. There is no mention in Inspector Pino's report of whether Alice Stanley or Chris Unsworth say Madeline was in either of the boats of three children that went sailing that morning. There were seven children in the lobsters group. It looks like the other six children in the group all went sailing, in two boats of three each, but that Madeline perhaps not. In plain terms, then, it appears from these statements that Cat Baker, or the friend who spoke to the mail on Sunday, may have fabricated claims about Madeline going sailing that morning. Also, Cat Baker made the claim that all the children were required to wear identity bracelets while being looked after that week. But there were no ID bracelets photographed on any child that week before the 3rd of May, the date Madeline was reported missing. In her first statement to the Portuguese police in May 2007, she told them, I have been in Portugal since March the 21st of this year, and this is my first visit to the country. My contract started on the 21st of March 2007. Earlier, she said, the 21st of April, which may have just been a simple mistake, and ends on the 7th of November 2007. But one year later, talking to Leicestershire Police on the 18th of April, she contradicted herself. She said, I work in childcare. I was contracted by Mark Warner in June of 2006. The first time I went to Portugal was the 21st of March 2006, where I worked as a childcare worker in the Ocean Club village, Pride de Luz. I went to a work interview and was contracted for one year by Mark Warner in June of 2006. Why, when first questioned, did she not mention having worked in Portugal the previous year? There is one particular incident that stands out from that week which, it is said, really does prove that Madeleine McCann was alive on the Tuesday at least. And that is the testimony of an 82-year-old widow, Mrs Pamela Fenn, who died in 2011. She told the police, though only three months later, as we shall see, that she heard a child, presumably Madeleine, crying from 10.30pm to 11.45pm on the evening of Tuesday the 1st of May. She says that she then heard a door closing at 11.45pm, and then the crying stopped. On the face of it, there is no reason to suspect that this was anything other than the unvarnished truth. Why would an 82-year-old widow lie about anything? Especially something so serious. But, as with almost everything in this case, nothing is quite what it seems. So let's now probe her statement in detail. I will read out the relevant parts of her statement. Mrs. Pamela Fenn, 20th of August, 2007. She has lived in the apartment since 2003. She also refers to the day of the 1st of May, 2007, when she was home alone. At approximately 22.30, she heard a child cry, and that due to the tone, the crying seemed to be a young child and not a baby of two years of age or younger. That night she contacted a friend called Edna Glynn, who also lives in Pride of Luz, after 2300 hours, telling her about the situation, 
who was not surprised at the child's crying. On the 3rd of May she received a visit from her niece Carol during the morning, who said that when she was on her terrace she saw a male individual looking into the McCann's apartment. She claims, however, that a week previously she was the victim of an attempted robbery, which was not successful, and neither was anything taken, thinking that the crying of the child could be linked to another attempted robbery in the residence. So there are three elements to her story. One, she says she heard a child crying for 75 minutes continuously on Tuesday the 1st of May, two days before Madeline went missing. Two, she says she was burgled in the week before Madeline went missing. And three, she says on the day Madeline went missing, her niece, Carol Tranmer, visited her and happened to see a man peering suspiciously into the McCann's apartment. But first, let's notice when she makes her statement. She does so on the 20th of August 2007. That's over three and a half months, or 111 days, since the date she says she heard the crying on Tuesday the 1st of May. So exactly how did Mrs. Fenn's statement, with its dramatic news of a burglar, a suspicious man, and a child's crying for 75 minutes, come about? By looking at the lead-up to it, this will help us to form a view on whether Mrs. Fenn was telling the truth or not. Newspaper coverage about Mrs. Fenn in several British newspapers suddenly broke on Saturday the 18th of August 2007. It's strange that the story broke two days before she gave her statement to the police. This is what the Sun told us. Their story was headed, Your Sis, Maddie is Missing and featured the McCann's claim that only now, three months after Madeline went missing, had the McCann's told their twins, Amelie and Sean, that Madeline had been abducted. But the story also made these revelations about Mrs. Pamela Fenn. The Portuguese cops are again under fire. The woman living in the apartment above the McCann's claimed she had not been spoken to by police until the British team arrived two weeks ago. Expat Pamela Fenn told them she disturbed a burglar at her apartment about three weeks before Maddie vanished. She is now to give a formal statement to Portuguese officers. A friend said she was surprised that neither the police nor the McCanns had approached her before. Pamela also said that her niece, who stayed with her the week Maddie disappeared, spotted somebody fitting the description of a man seen carrying a child away under a blanket. The pal added he was acting suspiciously. I have no doubt that the so-called friend mentioned in this story is none other than the McCann's official PR spokesman, Clarence Mitchell, whose job at the time Madeline was reported missing was the head of Tony Blair's propaganda machine, the Media Monitoring Unit, at the Central Office of Information. In this story, the burglary is said to have taken place three weeks before Madeline went missing, not one week, as she says in her official statement. The article quotes the friend as saying that Mrs. Fenn was surprised that the police had not approached her before. Surely the much greater surprise is that Mrs. Fenn had done nothing for three and a half months to report an attempted burglary, a suspicious man hanging round the McCann's apartment, and hearing a child sobbing her heart out in the apartment below her for 75 minutes, two days before she was reported missing. And we must ask ourselves, how likely is it, in the aftermath of the alleged abduction, the police would fail to visit whoever lived immediately above them to find out if they saw or heard anything that night? The article also says that Mrs. Fenn's niece, Carol Tranmer, stayed with Mrs. Fenn that week. However, Carol Tranmer told the police that she had stayed elsewhere in Portugal and only visited her aunt on a couple of occasions. Another contradiction. Mrs. Fenn's niece, Carol Tranmer, later said that the man she said she saw fitted the description of a man carrying a child away under a blanket. But it wasn't until late October, nearly six months later, that the McCann team released this artist's sketch of the man supposedly seen by Jane Tanner. Before then, there was no detailed description of him. So what description could Mrs. Fenn and her niece, Carol Tranmer, be referring to? It could only be the vague description given out by Jerry McCann on the 25th of May to the world's media, as reported by the BBC that day when they described the man as white, 35 to 40, 5'10 in height, wearing beige or light trousers, wearing dark jacket and shoes. Leaving aside the clothes the man was wearing, such a description, white, 35, 
five foot ten, could fit any number of individuals. Many of the four hundred or so guests at the Ocean Club that week were parents of European origin of children under five. It could have been almost any of them. So on what basis could Carol Tranmer declare that the man she saw for a few seconds fitted the description of the man seen by Jane Tanner? The Daily Mirror added some detail about the alleged burglary. It told its readers, Pamela Fenn said a man broke into her flat weeks before Madeline disappeared. There was no sign of a break-in, and it's thought the intruder may have had a key. She reported the incident to Portuguese police, but they did not question her again. The report went on. Mrs. Fenn, who was in her seventies, found the man scrambling out of the window and tried to grab his ankle, but he escaped. Whether Mrs. Fenn did report this incident at the time to the police is a moot point. I am not aware that they have confirmed that Mrs. Fenn reported this to them. In any case, if one looks at all the reports about whether Mrs. Fenn did or did not report this to the police at the time, it is very confusing. One version is that she didn't report the incident at the time. Another is that she never reported it at all. Another is that she never reported it all. Yet one more says that, because nothing was stolen, she thought it unimportant. Whilst a fourth, contradicting all the others, said she was beside herself with fear and contacted the police. These inconsistencies do not inspire confidence in Mrs. Fenn as a witness of truth, or at least those reporting what she said. But now, how credible is this statement? Found the man scrambling out of the window and tried to grab his ankle. Especially when we see how far Mrs. Fenn's windows were above the ground level. And also considering that Mrs. Fenn was 81 years old at the time, not in her 70s, as wrongly stated in some newspaper reports. The drop from the window of the flat to the ground must be 12 to 15 feet, meaning that he would have likely to have suffered injury if this story is true. But she says nothing about what happened to him after he scrambled out of the window. Did he run off? Did anyone else see him jump and report it? And did she really try to grab his ankle? Did she nearly catch him with her outstretched arm as he was in the very act of leaping out of the window? The mirror report continued. Mrs. Fenn's information only resurfaced after British police reviewed the case two weeks ago. Mrs. Fenn will now be formally interviewed for the first time on Monday. The timing of all these newspaper reports is of great interest. It was in the first week of August that the two Springer Spaniels used by top police dog handler Martin Grime alerted to the scent of a corpse and blood in 17 different locations in their apartment, on their clothes and in their hired car associated with the McCanns. As is clear from Kate McCann's book, Madeline, the McCanns were in a state of panic at this time. I suggest that these stories about Mrs. Fenn were planted in the British media in a fresh attempt to deflect from the disturbing leaks coming from the Portuguese police about the scent of a corpse and about cadaver odour being found in the McCann's apartment and in the hire car. Did these articles serve an ulterior purpose? If Mrs. Fenn's story about the crying incident was right, then that would surely prove that Madeline was still alive on the evening of Tuesday the 1st of May, which is part of the McCann's version of events. The Mail on Sunday followed up these stories the day after by claiming that the under-fire Portuguese police are preparing to take a fresh look at reports of two earlier break-ins in the apartment block where Madeleine McCann and her family stayed. Both burglaries, the mail said, one in the apartment directly above the McCann's flat, are understood to have happened two weeks before the McCann's arrived in Pride de Luz. So now we have this burglary occurring one week before the McCann's and Madeleine were there, then three weeks, and now two weeks. You would think that if they were going to invent a burglary or two, they would have agreed beforehand on an actual date. The Mail on Sunday also gave us this new account of what Mrs. Fenn said happened when a man attempted to burgle her. They reported, Mrs. Fenn scared him off. She told friends she heard a noise as she watched television and found a man escaping through her bedroom window. Her niece, who was staying with her, also saw the man. This is different from earlier accounts in two respects. One, her niece Carol Tranmer is now, for the first time, said to have been present and witnessed the burglary. Two, there is now no mention of Mrs. Fenn trying to grab the man's ankle. There was no suggestion or evidence that Mrs. Fenn's flat had been broken into by this man. He is said to have either walked in through an unlocked door, or he had a key or swipe card that would enable him to enter. 
why on earth would he choose to dive out of a window twelve feet or more above the ground when he could have simply walked or run back out of the apartment door? The whole story seems questionable. But then, in yet another version of this event, the man is said to have either broken in or climbed in through the window. The British media reports about burglars in Pride of Luz continued. The day after Mrs. Fenn eventually gave her statement at Portimao Police Station, the Evening Standard ran another dramatic headline. Burglar was on loose at Muddy Resort. The next day, 22nd of August, the Portuguese newspaper Correio de Mara ran an even more dramatic story titled Maddie screamed for her father. Now, Mrs. Fenn gave her witness statement to the Portuguese police on Monday the 20th of August, two days after the spate of news reports in the British press. Indeed, it almost seemed as though certain people had arranged for Mrs. Fenn to make her statement to the police, just so that two days earlier they could generate banner headlines in the British mainstream media about Madeleine. All this news about Mrs. Fenn being interviewed by the Portuguese police was, despite the alleged confidentiality and secrecy of the police investigation, which the McCanns so often spoke about. It seems, though, that the secrecy of the investigation was convenient when the McCanns were asked difficult or embarrassing questions, but could be broken at will when the McCann team wanted to get their message out. Anyway, despite the so-called secrecy of the investigation, Correo de Mara was able to give full details of what she told the police. The newspaper said, Mrs. Fenn confirmed she heard Maddie crying for her father the day before she disappeared. This is untrue, because in her actual statement she says the crying was on the Tuesday night, the 1st of May, not the Wednesday night, but later that day, on the Portuguese SIC News TV channel, a very different story about Mrs. Fenn was beginning to emerge. Here are some excerpts from that broadcast. Mrs. Pamela Fenn, the British octogenarian who lives above the apartment from where Maddie disappeared, says she has been harassed by the unwanted interest of journalists, and has denied having spoken to the police. She said she didn't have any information about the case. At the age of 81, this quiet, retired British woman seems to have been seriously shaken. After an outburst by her at her hairdressers, news that she was a witness in the Madeleine McCann case quickly became known to journalists' ears. According to what she said to have told the police, the night before Madeleine was reported missing, she heard a child crying and calling for her father for a long time. The fact that she spends most of the day on her veranda with a view across the tapas restaurant made the police return to the Ocean Club on Monday morning. Detectives quizzed her for about four hours to see if she had seen someone from the McCann group leave the restaurant to go and check on the children. Angry at the journalists' questions, Mrs. Fenn denied being a witness in the case and said that what the press was saying was pure speculation. I Three months since all this happened. I've never spoken to a journalist. They've written rubbish in the papers. I've never even known to be I've never known. It's all rubbish. And then, the following day, the 23rd of August, the Daily Express returned to the subjects of the alleged burglary at Mrs. Fenn's apartment. The suspicious man allegedly seen hanging around the McCann's apartment and the crying incident. On the alleged burglary, the Express wrote, Mrs. Fenn has also told police about an attempted burglary at her apartment several weeks earlier. She said a man broke in through the first floor window, but she disturbed him and he jumped out of it. The source said she did not think it was significant. She has lived in Luz for some time and at her previous address was the victim of burglaries on a regular basis. There are lots of drug addicts in the area who prey on tourists' apartments. Nothing was taken, so she did not initially report it to the police. There are several points to note here. 1. In this report, and I think this bit is true, she never reported this break-in and attempted burglary to the police at the time. 2. She thought it of no significance. 3. We're told this incident was not one week before the McCanns went on holiday to Pride of Luz, not two, not three, but now several weeks. And 4. No longer did the man enter the room with a key, but now he is said to have broken in through the first floor window, even though it was some 12 feet or more above the ground and there was no obvious way to climb up to it. But now we get a whole new burglar story in the Express, a second burglary. 
the report of an intruder echoes the experience of a Scottish holidaymaker at the Ocean Club Resort just three weeks before Madeline went missing. The woman told police that an intruder used a key to enter her apartment at the Mark Warner Run Resort on the first night of her stay, making off with personal belongings and £500 worth of currency. It was in the same block as the one where the little girl was taken from, she said. The police were called. They told us someone with a key had got into the flat. There were no broken windows and no forced entry. The Scottish holidaymaker wasn't named, so the story could not be checked. There's no credible evidence, to my knowledge, to support either burglary. Regarding the story that Mrs Fenn's niece, Carol Tranmer, had seen a suspicious man lurking around the McCann's apartment, the Express also purported to reveal new details about this. They told their readers, Mrs Fenn's niece, who has now been interviewed by detectives in Britain, spotted a suspicious-looking man hanging around the McCann's apartment about the time Madeline disappeared. She told detectives that he matched the description of a suspect seen by Jane Tanner, one of the McCann's holiday friends. Miss Tanner reported seeing the man rushing away from the apartment with a child wrapped in a blanket under his arm. A second witness spotted the man minutes later rushing past the church in the resort and heading to the seafront. The dark-haired man was wearing white trousers and a dark jacket. I made the point earlier that Carol Tranmer in August would only have known that the alleged abductor was white, 35 to 40, 5 10 in height, nothing else. Not until late October was this artist's sketch of the abductor released to the public. So how could Carol Tranmer be so sure that the man she said she had seen matched Jane Tanner's description? But now, in August, we hear from the Express about a man with dark hair, dark jacket and white trousers heading towards the sea, also carrying a child. The Express says that both the man seen by Jane Tanner and the other man were rushing. Those of you who have watched my film The Phantoms will instantly recognise this man with dark hair, dark jacket and white trousers. It is the description given to the Portuguese police by Irishman Martin Smith and two members of his family and in my film I produced persuasive evidence that this alleged sighting, which I call Smith Man, may also have been fabricated. In the Express report, we are seriously being invited to believe that the very same man, with dark hair, dark jacket and white trousers, was seen by Carol Tranmer lurking around the McCann's apartment during the afternoon of the 3rd of May, then seen by Jane Tanner near the McCann's apartment at 9.15pm carrying a child in pyjamas, and then seen by a second witness, unidentified, later on heading towards the beach. All of these three so-called sightings have so many problems about them that none of them seem to have any credibility. As I explained in my film The Phantoms, the Metropolitan Police said on BBC Crime Watch in October 2013 that a man had come forward six years after the event to identify himself as the man carrying a child seen by Jane Tanner. That tale by Detective Chief Inspector Andy Redwood seemed equally suspect. Most likely it was yet another fabrication in this mystery littered with fabricated statements. Another most interesting aspect of the express story is that the man allegedly seen rushing towards the beach is said to have been seen just 10 minutes after the Jane Tanner sighting at 9.15pm. The problem with this claim is that the Smiths say that their sighting was at 10pm and that's 45 minutes, not 10, after the Jane Tanner sighting. So where did 10 minutes come from? It wasn't true at all. I suggest it must be clear by now that this whole Express article must have been handed, ready packaged, on a plate to the Express, who simply churned it out and no doubt made a few extra thousand pounds from it by putting the story on their front page. The only person who could realistically have done this, that is, manufactured a story which once again confused the British public, was the McCann's PR spokesman Clarence Mitchell. In the Express's account of the crying incident allegedly heard by Mrs Fenn, they tell us that it happened two nights before Madeline went missing, the Tuesday, not the night before. Before we leave the subject of Mrs Fenn and the crying incident, let's now go back to her statement and examine very closely what she says. She says she heard a child start crying at 10.30pm. She says, due to the tone of the crying, 
it seemed to be a young child and not a baby of two years of age or younger. The term not a baby of two years of age or younger is a clumsy phrase. It could mean either under two or under three. The relevance seems to be this. The McCann's twins, Emily and Sean, were just two years and two months at the time the McCann's were in Pride of Luz. It does seem as though Mrs. Fenn was trying to rule out the possibility that it might have been one of the twins that she heard crying, by using that awkward phrase, not a baby of two years of age or younger. She was, it seems, telling the police, it must have been Madeline, who was nine days short of her fourth birthday on the day she disappeared. But we might well ask, could she really distinguish between the crying of a child aged, say, two years and two months, and one aged three years and eleven months, from the floor above? Had someone perhaps asked her to use this phrase, in an attempt to prove that Madeline was still alive on Tuesday the 1st of May? The matter became even more hard to unravel after Jerry and Kate McCann appeared on the Late Show in the Irish Republic in 2011. Up until that moment, the McCanns had come up with a tale that Madeline had come down for breakfast on the morning of the 3rd of May, the day she was reported missing, and said quite casually, Mummy, why didn't you come when Sean and I were crying last night? The McCanns say that Madeline didn't wait for an answer, but happily skipped away unconcerned. But on the late show, Jerry McCann introduced, for the first time, the idea that Emily might have woken up and been crying on the Tuesday the 1st of May. So I did actually, on the Wednesday night, I did actually spend the night in the room with the children. And why is that significant, do you think? Well, I, I don't know if it is, to be honest, Ryan. It's yeah. just I felt I had to share absolutely everything. But wasn't Madeline upset the next day? Well, the, next, the next morning she said, um, Mummy, I can't remember if it was Mummy or Daddy, why didn't you come when Sean and I were crying last night? And we both looked at each other and thought, that's odd, crying. And we didn't hear anything. Yes. And we had been back checking. And so we asked and said, when did you cry? And, you know, sometimes when we first put them to bed, they cried. And she just dropped it. And as we were saying, Madeline was very articulate. And we kind of looked at each other and thought, did they wake up? Or was it the night before when Emily had woken up? In weighing up whether Mrs Fenn's account is true or not, we've seen several reasons to doubt it, and one of the most important features about it is that it was not made until over three and a half months after the event. Let's go back in time to what was happening in August. At the beginning of August, it had been three months since Madeline had been reported missing. The abduction claim had been accepted by most. There was an international hunt for Madeline, with claimed sightings of her all over the place. The McCanns were often pictured looking happy and relaxed. But then there were dramatic developments. The British police had been busy behind the scenes. Senior British police officers, not connected to the Leicestershire police, Lee Rainbow and Mark Harrison, had made an assessment that Madeline might have died in the parents' apartment and that her parents may have conspired and arranged for her body to be hidden or disposed of. Lee Rainbow was the editor of this book, Professionalising Offender Profiling. The Daily Mail described him in 2010 like this. Mr Rainbow, 37, leads a team of five criminal profilers at the National Police Intelligence Agency and specialises in sex crimes and murders. The Home Office Agency, which describes itself as part of the police service, aims to improve police use of information, evidence and science to support operations. It is understood to have provided Portuguese police with a checklist of how to proceed. A spokesman said last night, In disappearance cases, it is common for the NPIA to advise officers to consider the possibility of the involvement of family and close friends. This is good practice for investigating cases. The NPIA gave similar generic advice to Portuguese police. Mr Rainbow, who has worked on major investigations including the Ipswich prostitute murders and the disappearance of Shannon Matthews, did not say there was any evidence the McCanns were involved, but his controversial report appears to have been a turning point in the Portuguese investigation. They sent top-class dog handler Martin Grime to Pride de Luz with two Springer Spaniels who had a 100% track record of alerting to the scent of a corpse. 
these dogs were not only capable of alerting to the presence of an actual corpse, but also to the past presence of a corpse. This is because the odour of human cadaverine is so powerful, which has a capacity to linger in any spot where a corpse has been lying for months or even years after the corpse has been removed. The dogs would be able to tell the police if there had been a dead body in the McCann's apartment in the past few months. And as we now know, they did, the two dogs between them finding the scent of a corpse and blood in no fewer than 17 locations associated with the McCann's. On Monday the 6th of August, the McCann's were living in a villa provided for them. There was at this time plenty of international publicity about Madeline. Sightings were still coming in thick and fast. The McCann's were in the limelight, doing carefully arranged photo shoots here and there, whilst others were minding their toddler twins. Then bad news struck. This is how Kate McCann refers to it in her book. On Monday, the 6th of August, the atmosphere changed. At the PJ's request, Jerry went off to meet them at a cafe in Portimao. They didn't need me, they said, so I stayed in the villa and busied myself looking after the children and doing some work. Jerry returned, minus the car. While he'd been in the cafe, the police had impounded it for forensic testing and brought him back to Pride Luz. And we all know what followed. The dogs alerted to blood and the odour of a corpse in the car and in the McCann's apartment. News of these developments soon leaked out. There was a flurry of lurid headlines in the British press about a corpse, about sniffer dogs, about blood, about DNA. The Portuguese police also did a search of the McCann's villa and the dogs alerted to places in the McCann's original apartment and on some of Cape McCann's clothes. I think it would be right to suggest that there must have been absolute panic and fear in the McCann camp. It was against this background that just twelve days after Jerry's car was impounded, the spate of newspaper stories began on Saturday the 18th of August, based essentially on the claims of Mrs. Fenn and her niece, Carol Tranmer. Influential stories about people burgling Ocean Club apartments and Madeline crying on her own for 75 minutes. I suggested earlier that all these newspaper stories may have been planted by the McCann team and or Clarence Mitchell, and the three items featured in Mrs. Fenn's statement, the crying incident, the alleged burglary where Mrs. Fenn tried to grab the man's ankle and he jumped out of the window, and the suspicious man quietly opening and closing the garden gate, all helped to prop up the McCann's abduction story. Images of burglars and suspicious men continued to suggest that there really had been an abductor in the minds of those who read the British mainstream press, whilst the so-called crying incident probably served two purposes. One, it proved, if true, that Madeline was still alive on Tuesday night, the 1st of May, and two, it confirmed the account of Madeline being left alone for periods in the evening while the McCanns were dining out. The combined effect of all these newspaper stories was to fix ever deeper in the public mind that the McCanns had been leaving their children on their own in the evenings in between regular checks, and that an abductor had snatched her during one of those periods. Now one feature of the newspaper stories on the 18th of August is that several of them mentioned that Mrs. Fenn was going to make a statement to the Portuguese police station of Portimao on the following Monday. Not only that, but they knew in advance exactly what she was going to say. These news reports were most likely planted by the McCann team stroke Clarence Mitchell. Did the Portuguese police know what Mrs. Fenn was going to tell them before she made her statement? It's very doubtful. Even if they did know, would they deliberately leak it to the British mainstream press who got the story first? Surely that's even more unlikely. So this leaves the question, was there a degree of collusion between the McCann team and Mrs. Fenn? The McCann team, I suggest, when they were under great pressure, may have used Mrs. Fenn and her niece Carol Tranmer to give the Portuguese police three separate questionable stories, all of which suited the McCann team's agenda, stories of suspicious men and burglars, and a tale of Madeline crying in the evening. I think it is quite possible, although I have no proof, that one or more of the McCann team, or indeed an intermediary, may have spoken to Mrs. Fenn before she made her statement. But whether I am right or wrong about that, can we take Mrs. Fenn's statement 
is any kind of indication that Madeline was still alive on that Tuesday evening. I don't think we can. I will now examine some more third parties who claim to have seen Madeline during the holiday. Staff at the Millennium Restaurant were asked if they remembered seeing Madeline on the Saturday night when the McCanns and the group ate there on the first night, but all could only remember seeing the twins. But as they say, there were so many children there that first night. And in any event, we have the photos of Madeline playing happily in the playground, probably on the first evening, dressed in the same clothes she was wearing on the plane journey to Portugal. On the morning of Sunday the 29th, the McCanns say they ate breakfast at the Millennium Restaurant. If we accept the evidence I discussed earlier about the last photo, that seems to be convincing evidence that she was alive, happy, dressed in a pretty pink dress and dipping her feet in the pool on a warm day at lunchtime that Sunday, the first full day of the holiday. But after this point, things become very vague. There is very little information, either in the Portuguese files or in Kate McCann's book, for example, which gives us much information about Madeline or what was going on for the rest of the week. So I am going to ask these three key questions. 1. Were there any independent, credible and verifiable sightings of Madeline during this period? 2. Were the McCanns seen out and about as a happy family of five? 3. Were the McCanns seen out and about as a family of only four? The first point to note is that we have no confirmed photographs of the McCanns nor of any of their children after the Sunday that week. The last photo is probably from Sunday and the tennis balls photo has so many queries about it that I do not think we can rely on that as any proof of Madeline being alive after Sunday. Second, in over eight and a half years since Madeline was reported missing, no one, not another holiday maker, a member of staff, a local, anyone to my knowledge has come forward to say that they had seen Madeline and the McCanns, all five of them together on that holiday, or as a family of only four together. Further, as we'll see in more detail in a moment, none of the statements made appear to give a definite indication of someone clearly having identified Madeline as alive after Sunday. Third, there was a strange change of plan by the McCanns regarding breakfasts and lunches. Despite breakfast being included in the price of their holiday, they decided from Monday onwards to eat breakfast in their own apartment. That is confirmed by all their Tapas 7 friends. Their stated reason was that it was too far to walk to the Millennium for breakfast. But was there a different reason? Fourth, we are told in various places that all the Tapas 7 group would take all their children each day to the apartment occupied by the Paines for a kind of buffet or sandwich lunch on their balcony. Yet the McCanns decided for the rest of the week after Sunday not to join their friends and to have their lunch in their own apartment, which was on the floor below that of the Paines. No reason is given for this. But suppose something had happened to Madeline by the Monday of that week. To stay in the apartment for lunch with just one parent bringing the twins home for lunch from the creche would avoid anyone seeing the four of them together and asking the obvious but awkward question, where is Madeline? If the McCanns were to take only the twins to the Payne's apartment, people would inevitably ask the question, where's Madeline? Fifth, we are told that on leaving their apartment during the week, one of the McCanns would leave via the back door of the apartment and the other parent by the front door. Why would they do this? Again, was it connected in some way with Madeline being missing at this time? Is it possible that all of this apparent subterfuge was intended to disguise the fact that Madeline was no longer with them? There was an echo of this in what we read earlier in Kate McCann's version of what happened on the evening of the 3rd of May, the night Madeline is supposed to have disappeared. You'll remember that we looked earlier at Jerry McCann's second statement, made on the 10th of May, a week after Madeline was reported missing, where he said, After 1730 they went to the apartment, the deponent, Jerry McCann, having entered by the main door, which he did not lock while he was inside the residence, Kate and the children entered by the rear door, after this had been opened from the inside by the deponent. Why this strange routine? It looks as though this was their routine for the week after Sunday, so that the two parents would never be seen out with just the twins. 
So does this represent evidence that Madeline was dead by Monday? Then we have some other very specific discrepancies to consider. On the Thursday of that week, the McCann's friends all seem to have got together and taken their children down for the afternoon to the beach. There is a photograph of them all together at a beach restaurant between 5pm and 6pm, taken by Fiona at the Pareso restaurant, which compares with the ones from the Pareso CCTV that we looked at earlier. But the McCanns say they put Madeline in the creche that afternoon. There is no clear explanation as to why the McCanns and Madeline didn't join their friends at the beach. Instead, the McCanns decided to play tennis. As part of the tale Kate McCann told about this late afternoon, she claims that on picking up Madeline from her creche, she made a point of relating that she asked Madeline on collecting her if she was upset about not going to the beach with the rest of the group. If Kate's story is true, Surely when taking Madeline to the crash that afternoon, she would already have known that all their Tapper's seven friends were going to the beach, and could have said to Madeline at the time, Ella won't be in your group this afternoon, but you'll be able to play with her at tea time. I suggest that this alleged conversation with Madeline, asking her if she minded not being with the other children, may be a fabrication. It is possibly another example of a self-serving statement of no evidential value, designed to bolster a false account of that afternoon's events. And we saw earlier how statements about a supposed high tea that afternoon were so contradictory that it seems unlikely that that event ever happened. A further query relates to the afternoon of Tuesday the 1st of May, pages 57 and 58. The McCanns hired a buggy that afternoon and took the children to the beach returning them to the creche for the last hour of the afternoon session. Yet, the creche records for that day clearly show that the children were put promptly back into the creche after lunch at 2.30pm and collected at 5.30pm. Either Kate McCann's story is wrong, or the creche records are wrong, or both. Just one other point relating to hiring the buggy, as Kate McCann claims in a TV interview given by Jerry McCann in 2008. He attempted to explain how the McCanns almost didn't leave the children on their own on that Thursday evening, but nearly took them to the Millennium Restaurant. So how was it they could hire a buggy on Tuesday, but not Thursday? That's one more thing that simply doesn't add up about the events that week, after Sunday. We dealt earlier with whether there was any reliable evidence that Madeline was still alive on Thursday the 3rd of May and saw that there didn't appear to be. So do we have any reported sightings of Madeline by other people from the Sunday through to the Thursday? We have these and I shall examine each one. Cat Baker, Madeline's nanny. A tapas restaurant cook who claimed to have seen Madeline, a claimed sighting of Madeline at a tennis lesson by journalist and former Crime Watch reporter Bridget O'Donnell, and a family who claimed their children were playing with the McCanns and their children on the Wednesday afternoon. So, first of all, what does Cat Baker say about Madeline that week? She is asked by the police and says, Most of the time in which I saw the family together, the children would be eating. The twins appeared tired at lunch, after a long day, and also perhaps due to the heat, but I never took much notice of the McCann's behaviour that week. That is the clearest possible contradiction with the McCann's equally clear statements that they were taking breakfast and lunch in their own rooms, and not going to any of the Ocean Club eating places at lunchtime. If the McCann's were telling the truth about having their meals in their room, it means Cat Baker wasn't with them when they were having breakfast and lunch. The McCanns were eating in their own apartment. So has Cat Baker made this up in order to try to convince the police that Madeline was alive that week? But in any event, we saw earlier how Cat Baker seemed to have been on very friendly terms with the McCanns, and is therefore not an independent witness. Second, let's look at the statement by the Tapas restaurant cook, 
Maria Manuela Antonia Jose. She made a statement to the police on the 6th of May. Here is an extract from her statement. When she was informed about the disappearance, she did not realise which child this was. It was only later, upon watching the television news that night, and after seeing pictures of the missing child on television, that she realised who the girl was, referring to her as Madeline, the name used by the journalists, remembering only at that moment that she had seen her during the meals provided to the children at the creche, and which take place at the restaurant where she worked, and during arrivals at the creche where Madeline spent the day, located immediately next to the restaurant. However, Madeline was enrolled that week in Cat Baker's Lobster Club creche for three to five-year-olds, which was located on the first floor of the main reception. That was not near the restaurant where Maria Jose worked. Moreover, she talks of meals provided to the children at the creche, but children didn't have meals at the creche. They didn't have breakfast there, and they all went back with their parents at lunchtime. It's not certain by any means that the children all had high teas every day. Further, she gives no specific detail about Madeline. Next, she claims to have recognised Madeline from the pictures on TV. This creates a further problem for her evidence, and that's because, as we've seen, the photo she saw on television that weekend would have been the so-called first photo, as we saw earlier. This was of a much younger Madeline. David Payne's daughter Lily looked similar to Madeline. Here is a photo of Lily on holiday in Pride of Luz. On the left, side by side with a photo of Madeline, just before she went on holiday. Perhaps for the tapas cook, this was a simple case of mistaken identity. Hers is a vague statement, giving no reliable or checkable details about any specific occasions. She worked in the restaurant and probably saw lots of children coming and going. It looks, then, as if this witness could be mistaken. She made claims about having seen Madeline taking meals that week, when in fact the McCanns were having lunch with the twins in their apartment every day. Third, Bridget O'Donnell, who was a journalist and writer. She used to work on BBC Crime Watch. She is the partner of filmmaker Jeremy or Jez Wilkins, who did much of the filming for the ITV documentary series My Big Fat Gypsy Wedding. She was asked to write a long article in the mainstream media in December 2007 because she was actually in Pride of Luz the same week as the McCanns. She titled her article, My Six Months with Madeline. This was a reference to her having been with the McCanns that week in Pride of Luz, and therefore she claims having lived with Madeline for the six months since she went missing. But despite that extravagant title, and despite she and Jez having become friends with the McCanns that week, there is not one sentence in the whole long article referring to or describing Madeline nor does she describe any specific incident. The only thing that comes anywhere near it is this reference to Madeline playing tennis on Thursday morning. Earlier that day there had been tennis lessons for the children, with some of the parents watching proudly as their girls ran across the court chasing tennis balls. They took photos. Madeline must have been there, but I couldn't distinguish her from the others. They all looked the same, all blonde, all pink and pretty. The statement, Madeline must have been there, is hardly convincing, especially with no other reference to her by Miss O'Donnell. So we cannot count that as credible evidence of having seen Madeline any time that week either. So forth I come to the Boyd family, who claimed that their little boy played with Madeline for most of the Wednesday afternoon, the day before Madeline was reported missing. Their story surfaced in a small circulation family periodical, First Magazine. Here is a photo of the actual article, which appeared just two weeks after Madeline was reported missing. The Boyd family was certainly in Pride of Luz that week. Indeed, it appears that their feature in the playground picture, which we noted was almost certainly taken on the first day of the holiday. Mr. Jason Boyd, then aged 39, is the man in the red shirt left of picture, with his wife Vicky, aged 34. Their son Louis was three, and they also had a ten-month-old baby with them. A year later, the family featured in Rupert Murdoch's Son. He is a photo of the family on the beach, reading The Sun. The article by local Portuguese journalist Daniel Gusmaroli began with this claim. The day before she disappeared, Maddie spent an idyllic afternoon playing in the sun with three-year-old Louis Boyd. Louis's mum shares her story with First Magazine. The article asked, Will Maddie's mum ever recover? If we look at the detail of Mrs. Boy's account, 
the feature writer tells us this. Louis Boyd couldn't believe that his new friend was so good at football. After all, she was only a girl. The three-year-old was having great fun tearing around with the pal he had met that afternoon. Her name, Madeline McCann, and they were giggling as they fooled around by the pool as their parents looked on. Later in the article, Louis is said to have looked at the posters Madeline featured in around Pride of Luz and asked his mother, Mummy, is this the girl I was playing with yesterday? His mother said, Yes. Louis is said to have replied, Why are her pictures everywhere? His mother said, Because she's lost her mummy. And the article notes that Louis went quiet. Later the article goes on. Vicky was sitting by the pool as Maddie's mum, Kate, 38, relaxed on a sun lounger and watched her children whizzing down the water slide. Maddie was wearing a sun hat, a little pink top and blue skirt, occasionally stopping to pull faces at her mum. As Kate looked on adoringly, Maddie went to the poolside to a play area to have a game of play football with Louie, just a sweet, happy little girl playing in the sun with other children. She and Louie were kicking a football around for about an hour. The two of them were giggling and having fun. They got on really well together. I spoke to Maddie's mum, Kate, briefly. She told me this was their first holiday abroad with the kids, and they were all having a lovely time. She felt the Portuguese were lovely people and very family-orientated. Madeline's dad, Jerry, 38, was playing tennis on a nearby court at the time, and after the match he joined Kate and put his arm around her. They seem like a really happy family, a good strong family unit. She is quoted as saying, When the posters went up on the Friday, Mrs Boyd said, We recognised Maddie immediately. Well, it certainly makes good copy. Except, of course, that the photos of Madeline that went up that week were of the so-called first photo that was anything up to 18 months out of date. The article also included half a page about Kate McCann's initial reaction to Madeline disappearing. It states, Kate and Jerry telephoned local priest Father David Heal, asking him to visit them at their apartment. When he arrived with his wife, Kate threw herself into the priest's arms and she broke down. The article continues, It took him almost three hours to comfort Kate. Father Heal explains in the article how the McCanns asked him to pray for Madeline's safe return. The priest added, We have been to see them several times when they are emotional and distraught. So in this lengthy article, we have what appears to be crystal clear, watertight evidence of Madeline being alive and playing happily on the day before she disappeared. It sounds like it was most of the afternoon, Madeline playing around the pool, then playing football for an hour, then returning to be with Mummy and Daddy by the pool. But there are two very big problems with this story, and several others besides. First, the crash records for that afternoon that we looked at earlier, what do they tell us? Let's have a look. They clearly tell us that Madeline was shown as being in the Lobster Group crash with her nanny Kat Baker all afternoon from 2.45pm to 5.30pm. So there's a conflict of evidence. Was she playing football with Louis or in the crash all afternoon with Kat Baker? It can't have been both. But there's another possible way of checking what happened that afternoon. And that's to look at what Kate McCann says about that afternoon in her book Madeline. We find it on page 60, Wednesday the 2nd of May 2007. Our last completely happy day. Our last to date as a family of five. If only it was possible to rewind, even for an hour. Today it rained. The children went to their clubs, but our tennis lessons were postponed. Instead we joined Fiona, David and Diane at the Millennium Restaurant for coffee. We then returned to our apartment and a little while later I left again to go for a run with Matt. I'd bought a new pair of running shoes a few days before we'd left for Portugal, and they were certainly getting a good initiation. They were pink, which I wasn't quite sure about. I wondered how seriously a runner in pink trainers could be taken, but after a few outings in the sand they weren't looking quite so glaringly girly. As we ran along the promenade, a small dog jumped out from under a bench and attacked my right calf, it was pretty sore, and I was a bit shaken, but I carried on as coolly as I could manage. Maybe he just didn't like those pink trainers. Jerry and I picked up the children, had lunch in the apartment, and then took them to the play area for an hour before walking them to their clubs. The tennis group lessons were rescheduled for the afternoon, Jerry's group first, followed by mine. After that, it was the usual routine. 
tea with the children, playtime, bath time, milk, stories, kids bedtime, get ready. So, no mention of any sun, only a mention of rain. And certainly, no mention of Madeline happily playing football with little Louis for an hour, or whooshing down the water slide. So what can we make of this? Was it fabricated by the Boyds? Were they roped in by the McCann team to concoct this story? Did the publishers of First Magazine check their story out with the McCanns? Whichever it was, no way can we take this as any proof that Madeline was alive on Wednesday the 2nd of May. Within the past few months, a British expat living and working in Canada, Lizzie Taylor, known on the internet as Heidi Ho, has compiled a very useful analysis of all the other claimed sightings of Madeline that week. Here are some extracts from her article, based on extensive analysis of all the relevant witness statements. Like everyone else, I once believed that Madeline was seen during the holidays, as there were so many people that claimed to have seen her. As I started to collate the witness statements and scrutinise each one, I realised that apart from Fatima de Silva, who saw Madeline and the family outside the apartment one day, there was not one statement that had a similar degree of credibility. I thought that the possibility of something happening to Madeline prior to Thursday would be impossible, but after reading all the statements, every one, except Fatima, allows for doubt. Some were very obviously mistaken. She then goes on to list other witness statements from people I have not mentioned so far. Here is Lizzie Taylor's list and her comments. Cecilia Diaz Famino, receptionist at Millennium, described a shy Madeline and saw them on days they were not at restaurant, therefore not proof that she saw Madeline. She may have seen one of the other Tapas children. Geronimo Salcedes, Tapas barman, admits to not being able to recognise if it was Madeline. Luisa Ana de Nona de Azevedo Cotino, receptionist, claims to have seen Madeline with the McCann's friend Dr. Russell O'Brien, but his daughter was not in the creche that morning and looks very similar to Madeline, so likely mistaken. Georgina Jackson, tennis instructor, was non-specific about seeing Madeline, only that she was part of the group for that morning. Charlotte Pennington, creche nanny, we've already covered Charlotte Pennington earlier in the film. Diaz Romao, claimed seeing Madeline at times she was not there, according to the crash record. Emma Wilding did not know Madeline well and makes incorrect statement about seeing Jerry. Paula Cristina de Costa Vieira, cleaner, says she saw Madeline McCann twice leaving the Millennium at about 9.30 to 10 a.m., but they didn't go to the Millennium for breakfast. Non-specific comments that do not confirm Madeline's presence were made by Jez Wilkins, Stephen Carpenter and Daniel Stupp. So what about that one statement that Lizzie Taylor thinks may be credible, won by Fatima Maria Serafim de Silva Espada, the daughter of one of the cleaners? She says that she saw the McCanns and their three children. Let's look at the relevant extract from her statement, and let's note that this particular alleged sighting took place on the Sunday, and see what a tremendous amount of specific detail she gives to the police as she unfolds what she saw. She states that this took place on Sunday the 29th of April, just before she finished her morning shift at 13.30, as she had the afternoon off that day. At about 13.15 she went to help her mother, who was cleaning apartment 5i of the same block, situated on the first floor. She clearly remembers seeing the girl, accompanied by her siblings and mother, leave their apartment 5a and walk to the stairs leading to the floor above. She was very close to them, at a distance of about one metre, observing their movements for a few moments, because she was charmed by them. Madeline led the way with a plate, perhaps plastic, in her hand, bearing a piece of bread. As regards the clothes she was wearing, she only remembers a skirt, but cannot recall its description. She noted, because she thought them nice, the type of shoes she was wearing, tennis shoes, light in colour, she thinks, which had little lights along the soles, which lit up each time she stepped on the ground. Her siblings followed behind her, wearing the same kind of shoes, and each holding a piece of bread in their hands. Their mother followed behind them without holding their hands. She seemed to remember the mother was also carrying a plate. 
Moments afterwards, perhaps the time it took to close the apartment door, the father came out and also headed to the apartment upstairs. When asked, she does not remember whether the father pulled the door closed or locked it with a key. So here we have a statement which I suggest clearly is credible. It is not vague, it does not look contrived. Moreover, she sees all five members of the family together, and after that I would contend that no one ever sees all three children together that week. What about her shoes? Unfortunately, we do not see these in the last photo. So we don't know if they are the same ones as this cleaner describes. However, we do have the photos taken what I think was the day before. And on this one, the playground picture, we can see that Madeline is indeed wearing exactly the same shoes as described by the cleaner. In the last photo, Madeline is wearing a pink dress. The cleaner remembers Madeline wearing a skirt, she thinks, but can't remember what colour it was. It's easy to confuse a dress with a skirt. This incident happens at about 1.15pm on the Sunday. Is it possible that Madeline was already in the clothes in which she is seen in the last photo? I think it is. So, in the statement of Luisa Anacotino, we have a detailed, wholly credible statement that is also fully consistent with the last photo having been taken about an hour later by the pool, after lunch on the Sunday. The clarity and detail of this witness statement shows up the other statements from the Ocean Club staff for what they are, vague statements with no detail and therefore lacking credibility. So, if this hypothesis is correct, it means that the crash records, which show Madeline as being in the crash for several hours each day from Sunday through to the Thursday, cannot be correct. I am sure this will be cited by some as strong evidence which refutes the hypothesis in this film. If we look closely at the records, we see that Madeline is being signed into the creche after some children, but before others. The arrival and leaving times are all sequential, and there are clearly a number of different parent signatures on the sheets, many of whom would not know the McCanns. So, if these records were forged, it means they were most likely forged at the times the creches were being held. In other words, Madeline's name entered onto the sheet at the time stated, but just with her not being present. We see that on most occasions, Madeline is signed into and out of the Ocean Club reception creche nearly always exactly five minutes after Sean and Emily are signed into and out of their crash at the tapas area. So we can assume from this that the McCanns dropped the twins off at the tapas crash, then walked Madeline along to the Ocean Club reception crash, thus Madeline being signed in five minutes after the twins. But wouldn't you have thought that when collecting the three children, that Madeline would always be collected first, then the twins five minutes later? The children were, as far as we know, always dropped off or collected by just one parent. So when collecting the three children, if the twins are collected first, it means the parent would have to walk with two two-year-old children all the way to the other creche, collect Madeline, then walk all the way back to the apartment. Wouldn't you think they would collect Madeline first to save trekking the twins to the other creche and back? and I don't think it's possible that they took the twins back to the apartment first, because there wasn't enough time to do that within just five minutes. I suggest from these records that the McCanns probably were putting their twins into the tapas creche and collecting them from the tapas creche. But I propose that as soon as they were dropped off or collected, one of the McCanns, Kate or Jerry, would walk to the Ocean Club creche to sign Madeline in or out, even though she wasn't there. This would explain why Madeline is nearly always signed in and out five minutes after the twins. If this is indeed the case, it means that it would have been much easier to carry this off if the nanny in charge, i.e. Cat Baker, was helping them to sign a child in and out that was not present. 
and we know that Cat Baker has always remained close to the McCanns and visited them at key times at their home in the UK. There was an interesting interview about Cat Baker given by Hernani Cavallo in TV Mice on the 18th of November 2008. Here are some excerpts from what he said. Some have doubts about the Ocean Club's crash records. The doubts increase if we pay attention to the depositions of Maddie's last nanny, Cat Baker. The statements that the nanny gave to the police raised doubts. When re-questioned in England, she corrected several statements that she had given in Portugal. She was allowed to refresh her memory from her previous statements. Cat Baker says she remembers extraordinary details about the day Madeline was reported missing, but says she doesn't remember who picked up Maddie and at what time. The Portuguese police called in calligraphy experts. These experts found discrepancies in the handwritings. Just one of the doubts that the analysts raise concerns the identity of those doing the form filling and their signatures in the form. The nanny's signature and her handwriting appear on the sheet where only the parents were supposed to sign. Did no one notice this? One more curiosity about Kate McCann's purported signatures in the crash records is this statement in her book, Madeline, about the fact that ever since she had got married, she had always used her maiden name. On the 4th of May 2007, the date after Madeline was reported missing, I became Kate McCann. According to my passport, driving license and bank account, I was Kate Healy. I hadn't kept my maiden name for any particular reason. It was just who I was, and who I'd always been. But when Madeline was taken, the press automatically referred to me as Kate McCann, and Kate McCann I have been ever since. Overnight our old life had gone, and I'd become a different person. If that really is the case, then we must ask why her signature in the crash records on every day except one was K. McCann, and not K. Healy. So to summarise, these crash records are so unreliable and contradictory, so much so that the suspicion of deliberate forgery arises, so they cannot be used as any kind of conclusive evidence that Madeline really was in that crash. I have mentioned the possibility that some witnesses may well have confused Madeline with another child. There was indeed one child on that holiday a child of one of the McCann's Tapas Seven friends, who was also, like Madeline, three years old, and who looked very similar to Madeline. And that was Ella, the daughter of Dr. Russell O'Brien. Moreover, as we saw earlier, Ellie was also on Madeline's lobster crash group. Here is a most curious incident, which I hope to explore further in my next film about Madeline. This is the statement of one of the receptionists at the Ocean Club, Louis Anna Cotino. She gave evidence of one of the Tapas Seven group visiting the Ocean Club reception area on the evening of Sunday the 29th of April and making an unusual demand for a block booking of the Tapas bar for the McCanns and their group so that they would be guaranteed a place there every evening. There are many inexplicable and contradictory features about this request but for now let's look very closely at what the receptionist says in her statement. She has been a receptionist at the garden for one year, but has worked there previously. The Ocean Club Garden Reception has less functions than the main reception and deals with subjects relating to activities, the pool, tennis, etc. and excursions. She points out that the family in question came via Mark Warner and this company takes care of all relations with clients and there is practically no contact between the clients and reception. She adds that this family, McCann, like all Mark Warner clients, have half board, that is breakfast and dinner. For dinner, the guests could choose between two restaurants, the Tapas and the Millennium. The first being a la carte and the second a buffet service. Clients make their choice not only because of the food, but because of the proximity of the restaurant to their accommodation. She says that the guests told her that the Tapas was of better quality but it was difficult to reserve there as a Mark Warner guest, as the Mark Warner daily quota was of only 20. In this concrete case, the reasonable option was the tapas, as the distance was only 40 metres from the accommodation, as opposed to 200 metres from the millennium. 
She remembers that on Sunday the 29th of April, one of the individuals of the group arrived with the child Madeleine McCann. She does not know his name and can only say that he was male and tall and thin, and that he approached her to request a booking for the whole group for the whole week and always at 20.30. When questioned, she confirms that the man was not the father of the girl, but one of the members of the group, whom was often seen in his company. The man justified his request by saying that the group had many small children, whom they would leave alone when they went to dine. She said that at intervals some two parents would go to the apartments to see if everything was okay. The deponent made some comments about the request, saying that the tapas received many requests and that Mark Warner only had a quarter of twenty per day, but upon the insistence of the guest she managed to make the bookings requested. She confirms that it was possible to see the apartment from the restaurant, including the window of the sitting room. She does not know in which bedroom the children were sleeping, but upon being informed that it was on the opposite side of the apartment, she confirmed that it would be completely out of sight from anyone at the restaurant, that the most viable solution would be to leave the children with a babysitter, which is the procedure normally adopted by clients. Regarding the question as to the availability of the babysitting service between 19.30 and 23.30, she confirms that the service exists and that it is free of charge. When questioned, she says that she does not understand, as the service is free, why the parents of Madeleine McCann did not use it. When asked, she says that the contact with this family was normal, like with other clients, and describes them as nice. With regard to the date of the disappearance, she says that she worked from 9 o'clock till 1700 hours and only returned at 8 a.m. on the 4th of May. It was on this day at 08.30 when she arrived that she was informed about the disappearance by colleagues. She only knows what third parties have told her and from what she has seen in the press. She never saw anything strange. During this interview, she provided a boot with the reservations for the tapas restaurant. Now, there is only one of the tapas group of doctors who fits the description of being tall and thin, and that's Dr. Russell O'Brien, father of Ella. The likelihood is that it was him who spoke to Miss Louisa Anna Cotino, but the receptionist says that it was Madeleine McCann with him. Is it not much more likely that this girl with him was his own daughter, Ella? By all accounts, she looked very similar to Madeleine. Could it be that the receptionist and maybe several other staff all mistook Ella for Madeline? After all, I am suggesting that Ella was there for the rest of that week, but that Madeline was not. All I can say now is that I think we must regard it as a distinct possibility. So I conclude with a last look at the fabled last photo. I've shown that there is a high probability that this photo was taken not on Thursday the 3rd of May as claimed by the McCanns, but four days earlier on the Sunday lunchtime that week. And as we have seen just now, credible evidence that Madeleine McCann was alive after then is wholly lacking. If Madeleine died, say, late on Sunday, that explains why no DNA of Madeleine was found in the McCanns' apartment. If Madeleine McCann died, say, late on Sunday, that explains why there are no photographs of Madeleine that week, apart from five taken on the day of arrival and the last photo. If Madeleine died, say, late on Sunday, that might well explain why the tennis balls photo might be a forgery. It was supposed to have been taken on either the Tuesday or the Thursday, but that's impossible if something had already happened to Madeleine. If Madeleine died, say, late on Sunday, then the McCann group would have had time to plan the elaborate abduction hoax that I described in Phantoms. If Madeline died, say, late on Sunday, that could help to explain why certain people in Pride de Luz the very next day contacted Robert Murat, who was then staying with relatives in Devon, England, and summoned him back to Pride de Luz, where his mother, Jennifer Murat, had been living for many years. Murat immediately booked a flight and rushed back from England, taking the 1,500-mile flight to Pride de Luz on the very next morning, Tuesday, leaving home at 5 a.m. Perhaps an abduction hoax needed time to be planned. The international media frenzy that erupted on the morning of the 4th of May quite probably also had to be planned. 
And here I bring in some words from Tanya Cardigan, one of the leading statement analysts in the country and who works closely with internationally known pioneer of statement analysis, Peter Hyatt. She has made a special study of the McCann case, focusing on the McCann's strange use of language, which she says provides valuable clues as to what really happened to Madeleine. She has written, What I believe may have happened to Madeleine McCann. I believe that Madeleine died before Thursday the 3rd of May. That the order of a corpse was found behind the sofa means she must have lain there for at least 90 minutes, since that is how long, depending on the manner of death and the environmental conditions, the order takes to develop sufficiently for a dog to detect it once the body has been removed. This would blow away the McCann's claims of 30-minute checks, since they clearly didn't notice her missing for at least 90 minutes. There is also the fact that the apartment was almost certainly forensically cleaned. There was no DNA to show that Madeleine was even there. Forensics look for what is there that shouldn't be, and just as importantly, what isn't there that should be. This tells me that time had to be taken to clean the apartment, something not possible in the time frames given for Thursday the 3rd of May. This tells me Maddie died sometime earlier in the week. Looking at the statements and how much is written concerning each day of the trip, I and others have noticed there seems to be a lot missing from the Monday of that week. We go from quite detailed statements about what happened before Monday to obfuscation and lots of I can't remembers. This makes that day sensitive, requiring further information as to why the sensitivity. If she died much earlier in the week, then that leaves plenty of time for the clean-up, washing clothes and hiding of the body. Why do the McCanns act the way they did? Innocent parents act a specific and expected way. Guilty parents also act a specific and expected way. The two are mutually exclusive. Innocent parents, had there been an accident, would have called 999, even if she was long dead. Parents act in denial and will always hope for a miracle. But the fact that they didn't call 999 means that there was something they could not explain away as accidental. This could be current injuries, old and healing injuries, evidence of sedation or signs of abuse. If Madeline died, say within 24 hours of the time the last photo was taken on Sunday, as I suggest, so much about this strange case can be explained. As I showed in my first Madeline film, the cadaver dogs of Martin Grime proved that someone had died in the McCann's apartment, and I propose that could only have been Madeline McCann. How she died is another matter. Gonçalo Amaral, the Portuguese investigation coordinator, thought it may have been an accident, falling off a sofa maybe. According to some, there is a certain amount of circumstantial evidence that an overdose of sedative drugs might have caused or contributed towards Madeline's death. Another possibility is that someone, not necessarily one of the McCanns, might have assaulted her and killed her. These and other matters I hope to cover in my next film. Another thing that might be baffling you is that if all this is true, how could they possibly get away with it? Why would powerful establishment people and organisations involve themselves in covering up what looks like a straightforward crime? This is another very important question, which will be addressed in the next film. But just as I started to get you thinking, here is a list of the very noteworthy people who were staying at the unassuming Ocean Club during that week. I mentioned at the very beginning that Clarence Mitchell seemed to have the power to plant any story he wished in any mainstream newspaper. You might ask, how the hell is it possible for someone to be able to do this? It is rumoured that Mitchell is a very high up operative working for MI5. There have also been frequent suggestions that every British mainstream newspaper publication has MI5 operatives embedded in key positions in their editorial staff. If so, I would suggest that Mitchell is in fact one of the puppet masters of these operatives, giving him 
the outrageous power to have printed what he wants and get away with it. Now it's easy to get enraged about people like Mitchell and focus our anger towards him. But in fact, he himself is probably just a puppet. A puppet of a system and a group of powerful people which is so full of corruption, so rancid to the core, so full of lies and deceit that the only thing holding this cesspit together is the continual propagation of more lies which are used to plaster over the cracks and keep the cesspit in one piece. In my next film, I intend to dive into this cesspit and see if I can expose more by addressing the biggest questions of all, which are, assuming Madeline died, how did she die? And why was it covered up by the British establishment?